My buddy's life got messed up big time. Let's tell this tale about my pal, who we'll call Jake. Jake was really into using dating apps, especially Tinder. I watched how it wrecked his life in a pretty scary way, right before my eyes. Jake was the kind of guy who'd meet a bunch of girls on these apps. He wasn't mean or anything, just really into the whole dating scene. He made sure that everyone he met knew what was up. They all knew it was just a fun, no-strings-attached kind of thing. At least, that's what he told me. But things took a turn for Jake. And a lot of it was because of this lifestyle he had. But there's more to it, because sometimes you bump into really terrible people out there. So, this one day, which seemed just like any other, Jake was chatting with a few girls on Tinder. Now you gotta know that Jake and I shared a room in our college dorm. It was an evening after our classes and Jake was in a really good mood, grinning ear to ear. He told me he'd met someone on Tinder who had a friend, and they were both into meeting up together for some fun. I'd never seen him so pumped up about a date. That Saturday, around 7 p.m., Jake headed out to meet these two girls at a bar nearby. Normally he'd text me after his dates to let me know how it went, or if he'd be staying out late. But when it hit 2 a.m. and I hadn't gotten a single message, I thought maybe he'd stayed over at one of their places. I was just chilling, having a few beers and playing some P.U. Big. I stepped outside for a smoke, and when I walked out of the dorms, I almost tripped over Jake. He was sitting right there on the front steps. What's up, man? I asked, kind of laughing. But he didn't say anything. I sat down beside him and got a real shock. His eye was bruised and he was crying. I'd never seen Jake cry before. Jake, dude, are you all right? What happened? I asked, but Jake just stayed silent. After that night, Jake packed up and went back to his parents' house for the rest of the semester. He didn't say much, just that he needed some time off. I was really worried about him. He seemed totally broken by whatever went down that night, and I was left wondering what could have happened to him. Everyone was curious about Jake, wanting to know what had happened. It wasn't until he came back the following semester that he finally opened up to me, and honestly, he looked even more worn out than before. That evening, as he was unpacking in our dorm room, I just had to ask. We were best buddies after all. I was dying to understand what had gone down with him. It was bothering me a lot. Jake finally sat down with me to spill the beans. I'll be honest, I thought I was ready to hear it, but I really wasn't. That night he had gone out to meet those two girls. He headed to the bar they had chosen. In the crazy flashing lights of the place, someone grabbed him and yanked him into the bathroom. This person was wearing a dress, so Jake thought it was one of the Tinder girls. But once he got into the bathroom, another guy pushed him against the wall and hit him hard, knocking him out cold. When Jake came to, his wallet was missing, his clothes were all messed up, and he was bleeding a little. And well, to be straightforward, his backside was hurting. Jake was too ashamed and upset to tell anyone, so he decided to go home. He needed some time to process what had happened. Jake went for his regular health checkup, something he did every year. And that's when the final blow hit him. Jake found out he had HIV. This should be a warning to everyone. You've got to be cautious. Sure, have fun, but always be safe. And definitely think twice before meeting up with strangers you've never actually seen in person. There are folks out there looking to take advantage of others. I see what happened to my best friend Jake every day, and believe me, it's the kind of thing you wouldn't wish on anyone. A My Story starts with the end of a long and uninspiring relationship. I was longing for something more physical, but my former boyfriend wasn't interested in that. So, once we parted ways, I began to seek out new companions without much thought. I was desperate for affection, and at that time, I wasn't too picky about who I spent my nights with. This is when a peculiar person enters my tale. His online profile caught my eye, mostly because of his unusual name. He boasted about having six dogs, and one of his pictures showed him with his large, muscular dog, which I think was a pit bull. He was reasonably attractive, and as someone who adores dogs, I couldn't resist swiping right. We matched, but initially we didn't chat much. Then one evening, driven by my desires, I decided to message him. He seemed eager to meet, and there were no immediate red flags. He arrived with a pack of red apple cider, and we headed to my dorm room to chat. As we talked, I couldn't shake off the unsettling feeling he gave me. Despite this, we ended up being intimate. 
Afterward, he surprised me by asking if I would be his girlfriend. But I declined. I just wanted him to leave as quickly as possible. Months passed, and I stopped responding to his messages, but he persisted in trying to contact me. Finally, one day, I gathered the courage to reply. I decided it was time to clearly express my feelings and set boundaries. I told him the truth. I was now in a committed relationship with a woman. I had been exploring my sexuality and realized I was a lesbian, not bisexual. I hoped this would discourage him, but instead, he tried to guilt trip me into cheating on my imaginary girlfriend. Thankfully, after a bit of persistence, he backed off. Months later, I was sitting with my friend Paige having lunch. She was browsing through Facebook and we started discussing her weird step-cousin. Suddenly, she showed me a photo that made my heart drop. It was the same guy I had met on Tinder, and then she shared more about him that was truly disturbing. He had a troubled past, including an attempt to take his own life when he was very young. Paige revealed that he had been emotionally abusive towards some of his past girlfriends, and had even stolen money from her stepdad. What was even more shocking was his casual boasting about almost ending someone's life, for which he only got a short sentence because he was a minor at the time. He seemed to wear this as a badge of honor, hinting he might do it again. On top of all this, he was heavily into drugs, yet, surprisingly, he had a wife all this while. Seeing my shocked face, Paige asked if I was alright. I confessed to her that I had met her cousin on Tinder. Her reaction was a mix of disbelief and worry. I admitted to her that we had been intimate, which made her even more upset. We were both stunned, trying to process all this. I was so embarrassed and now those unsettling vibes I'd felt around him made perfect sense. I continued to use Tinder for a while after that, but due to this and other strange encounters, I eventually decided to stop. It's a reminder that when you're dating online, you should always be prepared for some unnerving experiences. This story unfolds in a small town, and it's about a young person, say 14 years old, living in a place called Maple Grove, this kid, whom we'll name Alex, decided to try out Tinder, not really expecting much from it. Maybe a few odd people and perhaps a friend or two around their age. Alex's buddy, we'll name him Max, had already been using the app and seemed to like it a lot. So, Alex feeling curious thought, why not? Upon signing up, Alex was thrilled. Getting matched with strangers was intriguing. It felt like a chance to meet new people and perhaps make some friends. Among these matches, one stood out due to their strange username. It was just a series of ones and zeros. It struck Alex as odd, but they shrugged it off, thinking maybe the person was just quirky or trying to be humorous. This particular match, let's call them binary, was very active in messaging. Day and night messages kept coming in. Binary didn't share much about themselves, always more interested in learning about Alex, where they lived, what they did. Alex, feeling uneasy, often ignored these questions. Eventually, Overwhelmed by the constant messaging, Alex stopped using Tinder and blocked its notifications. One day, driven by curiosity, Alex looked up Binary's username, but found nothing. User doesn't exist, the app claimed. It was unsettling. Alex even reinstalled the app, hoping for some clarity, and messaged Binary asking about the account's existence. There was no response. Alex thought maybe it was a hacker or a glitch in the app. Getting no answers, Alex deleted the app once more wondering if they were overreacting. One afternoon while home alone, Alex was searching for an old toy from the 1980s in their room. It was a cool little collectible. Alex's parents, who were away on a trip to a sunny beach destination, never touched their stuff, so it had to be around. Suddenly, out of nowhere, the toy fell on Alex's head. Startled and confused, Alex looked up but saw nothing. Then their phone beeped. It was a message from Binary on Tinder, but how? Alex was sure they had deleted the app. The message was eerie and simple. Did you find it? Panicked, Alex dropped their phone and ran out of the room, slamming the door behind them. Since then, nothing more weird happened and Alex stayed away from Tinder and similar apps. After the bizarre incident with the toy and the Tinder message, Alex thought things had settled down. But then, out of the blue, a text message arrived on their phone. The message wasn't ordinary, it was a string of ones and zeros binary code. Alex, feeling a wave of fear, decided to use an online translator to decode the message. 
The translation sent a chill down their spine. I'm always watching. This message got Alex thinking about the risks of meeting strangers online, especially through dating apps. It's a world where anyone can pretend to be someone else. Alex mused. I could even pretend to be a young teen online, but that would attract all sorts of wrong attention. The thought was frightening. The idea that people could be out there, pretending, lurking, possibly with bad intentions towards others, maybe even towards kids. As a warning to others, Alex decided to share this experience online. They made a video talking about the importance of being careful and trusting your gut feelings when interacting with people you meet online. It might just save your life, Alex warned in the video. The biggest mistake happened during the Christmas holidays. I had just quit my job as a waitress at a small diner and was stuck at home for a few days because I was grounded. I was supposed to stay in the house, but I chose to stay in my room. I spent my time on social media, mainly Twitter, but I also used dating apps to pass the time. Tinder was the one I used the most. I wasn't totally honest about my age on the app, but I did mention in my profile that I was only 18. I was very selective, swiping right for maybe just one guy out of 20. I didn't think too much about the ones I chose. Some messaged me, some didn't. I had many short and meaningless chats that didn't lead anywhere. Then I met a guy named Zach on the app. He said he was about 25 and was really good looking. He sent me a funny pickup line, and we started flirting. After a while he asked for my phone number, and I gave it to him without thinking twice. We texted all night long. Our conversation was easy going, but Zach wasn't great at spelling or using correct grammar. I actually found that kind of charming. It was around 3 in the morning when I fell asleep, leaving Zach and everyone else I was chatting with without a reply. I thought they would understand that I had just fallen asleep given how late it was, but this wasn't the case. When I woke up around 11 a.m., I found 12 missed calls, 3 or 4 voicemails, and about 10 text messages, all from Zach. At first, Zach seemed like a calm and nice guy over text, but his messages and voicemails were shocking. I had never heard or read such horrible, threatening words. He said many awful things, but the worst message read, Okay, since you want to ignore me, I'll treat you badly. When I see you, I'll show you what I do to people who ignore me. Ever had a broken jaw? It's painful, and I can't wait. He said some really scary things. Right after that scary message from Zach, I blocked him and didn't even think about replying. I deleted all his texts and voicemails, trying my best to erase the whole scary experience from my mind. I didn't tell a soul about it, especially not my mom. If she found out, she would definitely have taken my phone away. Two days went by, and I was still stuck at home just lying around in my room. It was late at night, everyone else was asleep, and I was feeling super bored. I was thinking about the whole thing with Zach when it hit me. I had blocked him on everything except Tinder, where we first met. I had turned off my notifications for Tinder, so I hadn't thought to check it. When I logged back in, there were tons of messages from Zach. I didn't plan to read them, but the beginning of his message caught my eye. He wrote that he knew where I lived, and that he was outside my house, even mentioning it had two stories. This could have been a lucky guess, lots of houses have two stories. But what really scared me was his location. He used to be 30 miles away, but now his profile showed he was less than a mile away. I panicked, deleted him, and closed my Tinder account right away. I regretted it later because I didn't save any of it as evidence. I was too frightened and foolish to tell anyone. I spent the whole night looking out my window. I even let one of our dogs sleep in my room for comfort. I was so scared I felt sick. I stayed up until the morning and then slept until the afternoon. When I finally went downstairs my mom had some really creepy news. She said a man had come to our door asking for me, claiming he knew me from church. I didn't even go to church back then. My mom, being smart, told him he was at the wrong house and then called the police to describe him. She didn't wake me up, thinking he was just some random weirdo and that I didn't know him. He asked for her daughter not using my name. If this was Zach, I had no clue how he found me. I moved to live with my older sister after the longest month ever. The only thing that might have been related to Zach was an old beat-up green car I sometimes saw on our street. It probably wasn't him, but I couldn't help feeling nervous. 
This whole ordeal still haunts me, and I haven't used Tinder since. I want to remind everyone, girls and guys, to be super careful when using social media and talking to strangers. You never really know who's on the other side of the screen. In my early 30s, I was single and kind of shy. I hadn't been in a serious relationship yet. I dated a few guys, but nothing lasted more than a month. We just didn't click. I decided to try online dating to find someone who shared my interests. I tried several dating sites like OCupid and eHarmony, but I didn't have much luck. The guys who messaged me were a bit odd. Their profiles and the way they spoke were off-putting. They seemed too intense, so I avoided them. Then, I checked out the App Store and found Tinder. I'd heard a lot about it and its famous swipe right feature. One evening, after work, I decided to try Tinder. I bought the Tinder Gold membership and started swiping. I swiped left a lot, but there were some interesting guys. I also saw some funny joke accounts. After a while, I took a break and watched Fortnite streams on my TV. About an hour later, my phone pinged with a notification. I had some matches on Tinder. Three guys had swiped right on me. I was thrilled. It was working better than any other app. I looked through the matches and messaged a guy named Connor, who was 22 years old. He was tall, half Cuban, and very handsome. He was studying pre-law, which impressed me. I sent him a message and he replied quickly. We hit it off and chatted all evening. I hadn't felt this excited about someone in years. Connor was fascinating. He came from a hard-working family, held two jobs to support his mom and pay for college. After a week of talking, we planned to meet at a small concert in the park. He surprisingly had the day off. I dressed up and carried pepper spray, just to be safe. I got to the park and found a spot in the back. The crowd was gathering in front, and I hoped Connor would find me. As I waited, I noticed more people arriving. Some were families, others were groups of friends. The atmosphere was lively, with music playing softly in the background. I checked my phone. Connor hadn't messaged yet. I started feeling a bit nervous. What if he didn't show up? I shook off the thought and tried to enjoy the music. The band started playing, and their upbeat tunes filled the air. I tapped my foot to the rhythm, still scanning the crowd for Connor. People were dancing and having a good time. I smiled, feeling the excitement of the concert. Just then, I saw someone walking towards me. It was a guy about Connor's age, but I couldn't tell if it was him. My heart raced as he got closer. He had a friendly smile and looked around, as if searching for someone. As he approached, I realized it wasn't Connor. Disappointed, I turned my attention back to the concert. The music was great, but I couldn't fully enjoy it, wondering where Connor was. The night went on, and there was still no sign of him. I checked my phone multiple times, but there were no messages. I started to feel a mix of worry and frustration. Had something happened to him, or had he changed his mind? The concert was nearing its end, and the band played their final song. The crowd cheered and clapped. I clapped along, but my mind was elsewhere. As people started leaving, I stayed in my seat, hoping for a last-minute appearance by Connor. But as the park emptied and the lights dimmed, I realized he wasn't coming. I felt a mix of sadness and confusion. Why hadn't he shown up? Did I do something wrong? I stood up, ready to leave, when my phone buzzed. It was a message from Connor. I opened it, my heart pounding. What would he say? Would he apologize or had something unexpected happened? I felt really down as I left the concert early. Connor hadn't shown up, and it hurt. I decided to walk home, which was about a mile and a half away. I didn't want to ride the bus or take a taxi. About 15 minutes into my walk, I noticed someone behind me. This person was wearing a dark hoodie and kept a distance of about 20 yards from me. I held onto my pepper spray, just in case. I thought it was probably just another person heading home. I turned a few corners and crossed some streets, trying to shake off the feeling. When I looked back again, the man was still there, same distance. In better light, I could see he was about six feet tall, with a broad build and a thick beard. My heart started to race. He couldn't be following me, could he? He didn't look like Connor. I started to feel really nervous, 
and decided I needed to go somewhere with more people around. My home was too far. As I was trying to figure out what to do, I got distracted. Suddenly, I felt a cold, sticky hand over my mouth and an arm around my neck. I tried to scream and fight back. We both fell to the ground. I felt a sharp pain in my ribs and then someone else was there, fighting the man. But the arm was still tight around me. Everything went black. I woke up in an ambulance with a broken rib, but safe. The man who had followed me, Carl, was arrested. A father walking his daughter home had seen me being attacked and helped me. Carl had been using fake profiles on dating apps to stalk and rob people. I couldn't understand why Carl would hurt me just to steal. It seemed like he had more sinister plans. After a few months, I tried using Tinder again. I wanted to believe that most people are good, but I couldn't forget that there are others like Carl out there. A few years ago, when I was 18, I want to tell you about myself. I'm not very tall, have bright green eyes, and long dark brown hair. I think I look pretty nice. It was summer break, and I wanted to do something a bit naughty. So one night, I sneaked out. I walked quietly through some trees behind my house to get to my friend's place. We hung out in her backyard, drinking beer, feeling cool. While we were a bit tipsy, we started talking about Tinder, which is a dating app. We thought it would be funny to mess around on it. My friend, let's call her Kay, didn't want her own account, so I made one. I downloaded Tinder and set up my profile. I was a little drunk, but knew I was just doing it for fun. On Tinder, we matched with some people, and soon my phone was buzzing like crazy. I put down my beer and told Kay I didn't really want a date. I planned to delete my account when I got home. No big deal, I thought, but I was wrong. It was almost 4 a.m., and I had to babysit the next day. I couldn't be hungover, so I told Kay I had to leave. We hugged, and I walked back home through the trees. Two days later, I was babysitting the same kids I'd looked after for over a year. We were in the living room. I put on a movie for the youngest, Sadie, who was five and super cute. There was also Jacob, who was 10, and Ashton, who was 14. It was weird they needed a babysitter since Ashton was close to my age, but I didn't mind. I loved spending time with those kids. Sadie was sound asleep on the sofa. I carefully took her drink cup from her mouth, trying not to wake her. Jacob and Ashton were at the kitchen island, with Jacob annoying Ashton about something. I wasn't really listening to them. Walking over to them, my phone started vibrating. It was from Tinder, which surprised me because I hadn't gotten many messages since I downloaded it two days ago. I looked at the profile and thought it seemed fake, but I was just having fun, so I decided to play along. I thought Kay would laugh about this. A guy named Braxton, or that's what his Tinder name was, messaged me. His first message was scary. He wrote something about feeling my pulse while grabbing my neck. I read it many times, shocked. I couldn't believe someone would send such a creepy message. I felt really scared. Ashton and Jacob noticed and asked if I was okay because I gasped and turned red. I lied, saying I just had a bad headache. Then another message came. Is that your family? I was stunned, staring at my phone. Then he wrote, You're all beautiful. You're mine now. This really scared me. I asked him who he was and told him to leave me and the kids alone. I blocked him and reported him right away. It's been some time since that happened. I try to think it was just someone playing a mean joke. I'm not sure, but I can't forget that story. Telling myself it was just a joke helps me not be so scared at night. Over the past few years, I've used the dating app Tinder and met several girls. None of these meetings turned into anything serious, except with my ex, Lisa. We were together for a few months, but then I discovered she was secretly married and had three kids. I was shocked because I had no clue she was lying, and her husband didn't know either. I broke up with her as soon as I found out, but I still felt really guilty. After taking some time off from dating, I decided to try Tinder again. That's when I started talking to Emily. She was pretty, easygoing, and had a great sense of humor. Her social media profile showed she wasn't married, which was a relief. We'd been messaging for about a month, but we hadn't met in person. 
Then, about a week ago, my friends invited me to a bar in Palm Springs for a birthday party. The bar was a two-hour drive from my house, but I wanted to see my friends and celebrate the birthday, so I agreed to go. I looked up the bar online and saw it had live music and dancing. It seemed like the perfect place to finally meet Emily, especially since she lived only 30 minutes away from Palm Springs. I invited her, and she quickly agreed to come. She even teased me for taking so long to ask her out. After my last experience on Tinder, I wanted to be extra cautious. The party night arrived, and I got to the bar around 9 p.m. My friends were already there. Emily was supposed to meet me at 11. I spent the first couple of hours eating, dancing, and enjoying a few drinks. Right at 11, Emily texted me to say she had arrived. I went to the entrance to wait for her. As she walked in, I saw she was pushing an older man in a wheelchair. My heart sank a bit. The man looked frail and serious. Emily hugged me and said, I hope you don't mind, but I brought my dad. He's not well. I was surprised because Emily had never mentioned her dad's condition. In fact, she had told me he had just returned from a trip to Haiti and they had dinner plans last week. I smiled and assured her it was fine. I introduced them to the birthday guy, making sure he knew not to stare. He greeted Emily and her dad warmly. We spent the next few hours at the party. Emily's dad was quiet and didn't speak to me at all. He just watched the people around him with a blank expression. When Emily and her dad left, they used a van specially equipped for the wheelchair. As they drove off, I texted Emily to say I had a great time and hoped her dad would feel better soon. I wished I could have talked to him more. After Emily texted me a simple thanks and didn't say anything else for about an hour, I started to wonder. Maybe she didn't enjoy meeting me, or perhaps she was just too busy taking care of her dad. Those were the only two explanations I could think of. Later that night, around 3 a.m., my friends and I decided to head over to my friend's sister's place for a few more drinks. It was only a five-minute walk away, and we didn't want to risk driving under the influence. We were relaxing in her living room, music playing softly in the background, when something strange happened. The curtains were open, giving us a clear view of the street outside. Suddenly, my friend Mark pointed out the window and shouted, Isn't that Emily's dad? The guy in the wheelchair? I looked up and saw the same old man, alone in his wheelchair, rolling down the street. A chill ran down my spine. What was he doing out there by himself at this hour? I thought about texting Emily, but decided against it for some reason. Around 6 a.m., we all crashed in the living room, planning to grab breakfast at IHOP in the morning. At 7 a.m., I got up, freshened up, and walked to my car, still thinking about the odd sight from last night. As I drove towards IHOP, I saw Emily's dad again, sitting motionless in his wheelchair beside a tree on the sidewalk. I tried calling Emily, but she didn't answer. Now I was really worried. I turned my car around, intending to talk to him, but when I looked back, he was gone. I was baffled, but decided to go on with my day. While having breakfast, I couldn't stop thinking about Emily, so I decided to look through her Facebook profile. I know it sounds a bit creepy, but I was curious. I was scrolling through her photos when I felt that same eerie chill. There was a photo of Emily, her mom, and her dad after his trip from Haiti. But the man in the photo was definitely not the man in the wheelchair. He looked at least 20 years younger, healthier, and completely different. I couldn't believe it. Why would Emily lie about something like this? Just then, my phone dinged. It was a message from Emily, just four words that I still can't shake off. Daddy didn't like you. Then she blocked me. That was the last I heard from her. I sat there stunned, trying to piece together the puzzle. Who was the old man in the wheelchair? Why did Emily bring him and pretend he was her father? And what did her message mean? So many questions and no answers. But this was only the beginning of a much stranger journey, one that would take unexpected twists and turns leading me down a path I never anticipated. At the age of 22, I was beginning a new chapter in my life. I had just moved into my first apartment, bought a car, secured a job, and was free from the responsibilities of school and parental oversight. Despite these achievements, I felt something was missing, a significant other. I longed for a serious relationship so I decided to give online dating a try. 
I downloaded Tinder and started swiping through profiles of local women during my free time. Although I got some matches, none of them really engaged in conversation. Then one day, I stumbled upon a profile of a girl who seemed almost too good to be true. She was incredibly attractive, and I found myself more drawn to her than anyone I had ever seen. I swiped right, and to my surprise, we matched instantly. Skeptical yet intrigued, I spent the next two days immersed in our chats. Eventually, I gathered the courage to ask her out on a date. I braced myself for rejection or a hesitant response, but her reply was unexpected. She suggested with a playful wink that I should come over to her place instead. My excitement was through the roof when she agreed to meet, suggesting tomorrow at 9 p.m. I couldn't believe I was actually going to meet her. The night before our meeting, I was so thrilled that sleep seemed impossible. The following day, I spent hours preparing the best dinner I could manage, wanting to make a great impression. As the clock struck nine, I heard a knock at my door. My heart raced with anticipation as I opened it, and there she was, just as stunning in real life as in her photos. As I welcomed her in, completely mesmerized by her presence, I hardly noticed the large man following behind her. It wasn't until he pulled out a gun and hit me in the back of the head that I realized what was happening. When I regained consciousness, I found myself alone, my electronics and other valuables gone, including my phone. I rushed to my neighbor's place to call the police. Despite reporting the incident, there have been no leads on her or the man, no arrests made. The lesson I learned is clear. No matter how attractive someone may seem, it's always safer to meet in public places a few times before revealing where you live. I've often met guys through the dating app Tinder, and fortunately, I've always been safe. I considered myself fearless and trusted people easily. The men I met from Tinder and rode with in their cars were usually just ordinary guys, not at all strange or dangerous. I thought I was just fortunate, but that changed. I had been chatting with a guy on Tinder for some time. I was really struggling to move on from my previous relationship and hoped meeting someone new might help. This guy, whom I'll call Jake, seemed very down-to-earth and friendly during our video calls. I began to develop feelings for Jake, feeling eager to meet him in person because he came across as kind and respectful, unlike my ex. One evening, I was particularly upset about my past relationship, so I video called Jake again. He kept suggesting we should have an adventure together. He proposed we go to his workplace to watch a movie. It was late, close to midnight, but I decided to take a chance and meet him. When he arrived at my university, my friend saw him and commented on how nice and good looking he was. I joined him in his car and everything seemed normal. We reached his workplace, but then something unsettling happened. Jake realized he forgot his keys and surprisingly took out a small knife, claiming he knew a trick to open the door. He managed to unlock the door with the knife, which was alarming because there were no security alarms triggered. The place was upscale and well-maintained, yet the lack of security was strange. I tried to stay calm and give him the benefit of the doubt, thinking he might have genuinely forgotten his keys, but somewhere inside, I couldn't shake the feeling that this place might not actually be his workplace. We watched a movie and snuggled on the sofa. Things felt fine at that moment, and I began to think the place might indeed be his workplace considering how familiar he was with it. However, the way he opened the door with a knife still made me uncomfortable. Things quickly took a turn for the worse. As we got closer, Jake started making weird noises. It wasn't normal or attractive at all. He sounded really odd, almost scary. It was like something out of a strange movie, and it made me feel uneasy. Then, in the darkness of the room, I suddenly saw flashes. Jake had taken photos of me without asking. I was there, with no clothes on, and he was taking pictures. I immediately told him to delete them. He hesitated and didn't let me see his phone for a few moments. Finally, seeming annoyed, he deleted them, but I was sure he had sent them to someone else. I wasn't naive. I felt embarrassed and told him it was wrong, but he just said it was a harmless joke. A harmless joke. That's when I realized Jake might be dangerous. But in that moment, I doubted myself and thought I was overreacting. I gave him another chance and stayed next to him. Then he climbed on top of me, claiming he needed to text his sister. But then, 
he took another photo of me. He pretended to delete the photos again, but I was certain he was sending them to someone else. After that, I quickly got dressed. He offered to drive me back to my dorm. When I got back, I said goodbye to him and hoped I would never see him again. I blocked him on everything. I had once thought a surprise hike in the woods with a Tinder date was the creepiest thing, but this was on a whole new level. Now the thought of those photos being shared without my consent makes me sick. They could be anywhere on the internet, being seen by people I don't know. I don't think I'll be able to move past this for a very long time. Some time ago I found myself really bored and had just ended a relationship. My housemate Jamie suggested I try out Tinder for fun. We spent time on the app, playfully chatting with matches and teasing guys who were clearly there just for quick flings. We never planned to actually meet anyone from the app. However, life had other plans, and Jamie and I had to move to different cities. In my new city, which was much busier, I kept using Tinder, mainly because I didn't know many people around. My experiences with Tinder dates were awful, one after the other. But then, I started talking to this nice-seeming guy. Let's call him Mark. He was eight years my senior, which didn't bother me. Mark was part indigenous, with a tan skin tone that stood out next to my pale skin. He was shorter than me but very well built, with short brown hair and dark eyes that were almost black, topped with a confident, charming smile. We chatted every night for a week. I discovered we shared many interests, even the quirky ones that most people don't care about. I felt I could be completely open with him, and it felt wonderful. So I agreed to meet Mark one evening. He was going to pick me up and we planned to go to a local Tim Hortons for coffee. Since I don't drive, I gave him my address. He arrived in a company car, making him easy to spot. He looked even better than his photos. We talked on the drive to Tim Hortons and continued chatting there until the place closed at midnight. I learned a lot about him during that time. Mark had been married and had a son, but the marriage ended when he found out his wife was unfaithful. This had happened just a few months before we met. He shared stories about his challenging past, but emphasized how he was changing his life. This should have been a warning sign for me, but I tend to be open-minded and believe in second chances. Part of his past included time in jail, which he mentioned casually. I figured it was for something minor, like a small fight or marijuana possession, not uncommon in Canada. After the coffee shop closed, he drove me home. I told him I had a great time and asked him to text me once he got back to his place to ensure he got home safely. As I settled into bed that night, I couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and nervousness about this new connection. Mark seemed like a great guy, but his casual mention of jail time lingered in my mind. However, I pushed those thoughts aside, choosing to focus on the positive aspects of our meeting. Little did I know, this was just the beginning of a series of events that would profoundly change my perspective on trust and relationships. In the following days, our conversations continued delving deeper into our lives and experiences. Mark shared more about his efforts to turn his life around, while I opened up about my own challenges and aspirations. We planned to meet again soon, and I found myself eagerly anticipating our next encounter. But as the days turned to weeks, I began to notice subtle inconsistencies in Mark's stories. He would occasionally contradict himself, and sometimes he seemed evasive when I asked about specific details of his past. This raised red flags in my mind, but I brushed them off, attributing them to my overthinking. Our second meeting was set for a weekend brunch. I was looking forward to it, hoping to clarify some of the doubts that had crept into my mind. As the day approached, I couldn't shake off a feeling of unease, wondering if I really knew the person I was about to meet again. That night as I was getting ready for bed, my phone buzzed. It was a message from Mark, asking if we could see each other again. Over the next couple of weeks, we went on several more dates, usually after his work since he didn't go back to his place first. I often saw him in his work uniform, but one date was canceled because he got stopped by the police. He told me he was driving without a license due to unpaid parking tickets from when he was in jail. He suspected his ex tipped off the cops. I found this concerning, but I let it slide. After a few more dates, Mark invited me to spend a weekend at his place. I felt comfortable and excited about it, he picked me up in his company car, despite not having a valid license. On our way, he revealed he was a recovering addict living in a recovery house, 
This was a bit alarming, but I admired his efforts to improve. When we arrived at his place, he said we had to be quiet because I wasn't supposed to be there. His room was simple, a bed, a chair, a side table, and a dresser. It was messy, yet sparse. I sat on his bed while he left to drop off the car at his boss's place, instructing me not to open the door to anyone. I felt uneasy, but tried to ignore it. Later, Mark returned with a bottle of whiskey, explaining we had to be quiet about it since alcohol wasn't allowed in the recovery house. I'm not much of a drinker, but I didn't want to spoil his mood. We ordered pizza and watched Supernatural on Netflix. As the night went on, he drank steadily. At one point he stood up in his boxers revealing a poorly inked swastika tattoo on his thigh. He said he got it in jail. This shocked me, but I tried to overlook it and cuddled with him. The night turned intense. The next day, we watched more Netflix, and he played guitar for me. In the evening, since he didn't have the car, a friend of his had to drive me home. As we got closer to my place, I started feeling really anxious, almost having a panic attack. As I sat in the car, my mind raced with questions and doubts about Mark. The red flags I'd ignored now seemed glaringly obvious. The jail time, driving without a license, the secretiveness at the recovery house, and that disturbing tattoo. All these pieces formed a picture that I couldn't ignore anymore. I realized I had been overlooking significant warning signs because I wanted to believe in the best in him. The ride home felt like an eternity, with each passing minute amplifying my unease. When I finally reached my doorstep, I thanked his friend and hurried inside. Alone in my room, I reflected on the weekend. The excitement I had felt before now seemed foolish in the light of reality. I knew I had to make a decision about my relationship with Mark. Despite my desire to see the good in people, I couldn't ignore the signs that something wasn't right. The realization that I might be in a potentially dangerous situation hit me hard. As I lay in bed, I decided to take some time to think about my next steps, knowing that whatever I chose to do, it would be a decision made with a clearer, more cautious mind. Feeling uneasy, I told Mark I wasn't comfortable with his friend driving us. Mark, looking a bit annoyed, insisted that his friend was almost there, and it would be rude to cancel now. Eventually, he agreed to accompany me in the car. When I saw the friend, my discomfort grew. He looked rough like someone from a notoriously bad area known for drug problems. His face was marked with sores and scabs, and he had an unsettling aura. Reluctantly, I got into the back seat while Mark sat in front. Throughout the ride, Mark held my hand, probably noticing how scared I was. His friend drove recklessly, speeding and swerving, which only added to my fear. I quietly cried during the ride, and the friend laughed mockingly, asking if I was scared of him. I didn't respond, but inside I was terrified. When we finally reached my place, Mark walked me to my door, apologizing with a sad look in his eyes. I rushed inside and spent the night crying in my bed. Mark texted me later, apologizing again, but then I didn't hear from him for a couple of days. When I finally got a reply, he explained that he was upset with his friend that night. We continued talking for a few days, but then he stopped responding. As a recovering addict, this silence worried me even more. I called and texted him repeatedly, growing increasingly anxious. In a moment of impulse, I decided to search his full name in public records, something I should have done earlier. I found a list of parking and speeding tickets, but what truly caught my eye was an entry for aggravated assault. Unable to access more details, I searched his name in City Online and found a news article from 10 years ago. The article detailed how Mark and three others had been arrested for a brutal home invasion and stabbing, believed to be gang-related. They had attacked a man in his home, stabbing him multiple times. Although the victim survived, Mark was initially charged with attempted murder. He got a reduced sentence for testifying against the others, resulting in an aggravated assault charge and a five-year jail term. This was far more serious than what Mark had portrayed. I was in shock. I texted Mark telling him to never contact me again and warning him not to come near my place. I blocked him on all social media and my phone. As I sat there, numb and shaking, the gravity of the situation hit me. I had been so close to someone with such a violent past without fully realizing it. The charming man I thought I knew was a facade, masking a history of violence and deceit. 
I felt betrayed, scared, and angry at myself for ignoring all the warning signs. I spent the next few days in a daze, trying to process everything. The fear of him possibly showing up at my door lingered in my mind, keeping me on edge. I decided to confide in a close friend, seeking comfort and advice on how to handle the situation. My friend was equally shocked and concerned, insisting that I should report my experience to the authorities, just to be safe. As I lay awake at night, I couldn't help but wonder how many others like Mark were out there, hiding their true selves behind a mask of charm and deceit. This experience was a harsh lesson in trust and the importance of being cautious, especially in the world of online dating. Throughout this ordeal, I kept my old friend Jess in the loop. A few days after the shocking discovery about Mark, I shared the latest update with her. I was pretty upset and venting to her about everything. Jess, always looking out for me, asked if there was anything she could do to help. In a half-joking, half-serious tone, I said it would make me feel better if she called Mark and gave him a piece of her mind. To my surprise, she was up for it. She rarely knew people by their real names, preferring nicknames instead. I laughed, half thinking she wasn't serious, but I sent her Mark's name and number anyway. Moments later, Jess texted me, saying she had called him and had a go at him, calling him out for his behavior. We shared a laugh over it and I felt a bit lighter thanks to her support. But then, about 30 minutes later, my doorbell rang. I was in the basement at the time, so it took me a while to get to the stairs. I wasn't expecting anyone, and the sudden ring made me cautious. Suddenly, there was a loud, forceful knock that startled me. I immediately called my dad for advice. He told me to stay calm and avoid being seen through the windows. I crept up to the second floor and peered through the curtains. There was a shadowy figure standing at my door, unrecognizable. The knocking turned into an angry pounding that set my heart racing. I ducked under the window, feeling scared. This went on for about 20 minutes before it suddenly stopped. When my phone buzzed, it made me jump. It was my dad on the line. He had called a family friend who was a police officer living nearby. My dad explained that the officer had agreed to check things out. Given that we lived in a townhouse complex, the houses were close together, so it was easy for the officer to come by quickly. Later, my dad visited me to make sure I was okay. He said the officer had stood on the front step in his uniform, and the person at my door had seen him and driven away. After this incident, I deleted my Tinder account and swore off dating apps. This experience had made me extremely wary of meeting new people. I started running background checks on almost everyone new I met. My anxiety levels went through the roof, and I found myself leaving the house less and less, almost never going out now. The takeaway from all this is a stark reminder. When you're meeting people online, you never truly know who they are. It's crucial to be cautious when meeting strangers. You can never be sure of the danger you might be walking into. And sometimes, it's best to listen to your instincts. They might just save your life. A month ago, I moved to a new country where I hardly knew anyone. This made me feel lonely and bored a lot of the time. Even though I wasn't a fan of using Tinder, I decided to give it a try to meet people. I spent a lot of time swiping and chatting briefly with the people I matched with. But I noticed that most of the people I matched with were guys who wanted to meet up right away, which made me a bit uncomfortable. Everything changed when I matched with a 30-year-old woman who quickly said hello and didn't waste time asking for my phone number. Since I was new to Tinder, I thought this was normal, so I gave her my number without thinking too much about it. And that's where I made my first mistake. At the beginning, everything seemed fine. The woman, named Diana, would send me voice messages and we talked a little bit about ourselves, but nothing deep. She seemed really eager to talk, often sending me multiple messages if I didn't reply quickly. I found her persistence a bit odd, but didn't think much of it. After talking for a day, she asked to meet up. Our conversations hadn't been very deep, but I agreed, and we planned a time and place to meet. However, just hours before we were supposed to meet, I got cold feet. I deleted Tinder and sent her a message to apologize. That's when things started to get strange. She replied saying it was okay, but then she sent several messages and quickly deleted them before I could read them. Later, she tried to video call me several times. I didn't answer, telling her I was busy, but she kept calling, 
She even called me twice at 2 a.m. when I was out and had had too much to drink. At that point, I blocked her. Feeling a bit guilty, but mostly relieved, I thought I had put an end to the weird situation. After all, being a young woman in her 20s and living abroad, safety comes first. But it turned out the situation was far from over. The next morning I received a hello from a number I didn't recognize. The WhatsApp profile picture showed an older man which confused me even more. I asked who it was and got a reply almost immediately. Hi, it's Diana. I'm using my dad's phone. Why did you block me? Did I do something to annoy you? Despite how strange this was, I decided to be honest and explain my feelings. She said it was okay, so I blocked this new number too. But in no time, another message popped up from a different unknown number. This time the message was more direct. Hi, it's Diana. Why do you keep blocking me? I need to talk to you. Text me. This was no longer amusing. I told her I didn't want to talk anymore, but she insisted, claiming she had to tell me something important about a girl who was harassing her using black magic. I made it clear I wasn't interested, but she doubted my belief in her story. So I blocked her again, for the third time. For... I'm not sure if this was all some twisted joke, but it definitely made my first Tinder experience a nightmare. I keep wondering if this is a common occurrence because I'm considering giving Tinder another try. This time, I'll be more cautious about sharing my number before getting to know someone better. Here's to hoping things go smoother in the future. And to Diana, please, no more messages or contact. Just stop. I'm usually careful with online dating. I talk a lot before meeting, choose public places for the first meetup, and let my friends know where I'll be, just to be safe. The dates are often fun, sometimes not great, but I've never felt scared. I've even made some good friends through it. Some people, I never hear from again, which is fine by me. This one time, I met a guy on POF. We chatted a lot on the app and even talked on the phone for hours. He seemed like a nice guy, so we decided to meet up. He lived about 45 minutes away in a town I wasn't familiar with. We talked about me staying over and planned to get some drinks. I thought about booking a hotel room instead of staying at his place right away. I'm not sure why, but I stopped thinking clearly at some point because I left my car near a park. I had no clue how to get back to it if I needed to because he took so many turns driving to his place. He even suggested I hide in the back of his van because it's a small town and he didn't want anyone to see me. I should have walked back to my car then. He also took my phone and locked it away to hide its location. Looking back, I should have realized something was wrong. At the time, based on our conversations, I thought maybe it was part of some odd game he thought up. He even made it seem like a game before I left my town. When we got to his house, everything seemed normal. We watched movies, talked, and had dinner. But then he started acting strange, asking weird questions in a way that made me feel stupid, pacing around, and smoking a lot. He became very intense. I started feeling uncomfortable and suggested going back to my car to head home, but he didn't take me seriously. He said I could take a cab if I really wanted to leave, but I couldn't afford a cab without knowing exactly where my car was. I got my phone back eventually, and messaged a friend to be ready in case I needed to call 911 and she needed to come get me. I figured out how to get to my car from a certain point if she could pick me up. Things calmed down after a while, and I decided to just sleep and deal with getting back to my car in the morning. I did make it home safely. We kept talking after that, through calls and texts, acknowledging the awkwardness of our meetup. He apologized, so we decided to meet again, and it was much better. I felt at ease, and we laughed a lot. It felt good. I even chose to stay over this time, not because I felt stuck. He offered to get my pillow from my bag, and as he did, my makeup bag fell out. He put my makeup bag back where it fell and told me about it. I fell asleep while we were talking. The next morning, he drove me back to my car. We didn't talk much for the rest of the day because I was busy being a bridesmaid and had a lot to do. In the evening, he texted me, and I told him I'd call him back later when I was free, as I was busy at the moment. I didn't hear back from him, so when I was free around 2 a.m., I texted him to see if he was still up and wanted to talk. This wasn't a weird time for us to chat, but this time, he got really upset with me. 
He started questioning what I wanted from him and accused me of having some sort of plan. I was confused. I reminded him that we had agreed to start as friends and get to know each other better. Then he called me foolish for bringing my makeup bag, saying it was just a trick and calling me messy for saying I'd call him later, even though he knew I was busy. All I could think about was how easy it would be to just walk away from this mess. A week later, I received a voicemail at work demanding that I call back immediately. My office has poor reception, and I didn't even see a missed call notification, just the voicemail. When I checked an hour later to try and find out who it was from, the message had disappeared. I was sure I saved it but couldn't find it. Not even in the deleted messages. I figured it was him because something similar happened before. The message he left was really scary. He said terrible things, accusing me of trying to gather evidence at his place to get people in trouble. He insulted me in ways that were shocking and threatened me. This was the last I heard from him as of Sunday morning. Luckily, he doesn't know much about me, not even where I live. I've never dealt with anything like this before, and I'm not sure what to do. I'm just hoping this doesn't get any worse. Once upon a time, I had a job at a small motel chain in the middle of the country, working the night shift. My schedule was usually from late at night until early in the morning. Being a young woman working these hours, I've seen my fair share of odd events. The most terrifying experience I had there occurred within the first few weeks of my job. One evening, just before my shift began, I was browsing Tinder. I was young, single, and 22 after all. I matched with a guy who was just my type, a bit dark and mysterious with a love for Ouija boards and tarot cards. We hit it off and chatted for a while, but then I mentioned I had to leave for work, and we said our goodbyes. That night was significant because it was my first time managing the motel alone after my training had ended. I was a bit on edge, but nothing prepared me for when a man I sort of recognized approached the front desk and asked for me by name. Alarm bells went off in my head because something about him just felt off. It turned out he was the guy from Tinder. He figured out I was close by, guessed I might be working at the motel he was staying at, and decided to check. This was a huge red flag for me. For the next two hours, I couldn't leave my desk because he wouldn't stop talking to me. He shared stories about his ex, how he got into fights, and made inappropriate comments about me. I had never encountered something like this at work before, and was unsure how to handle it. Eventually he went to his room around 2 or 3 in the morning, and I took the chance to take a break outside. No sooner had I lit my cigarette than he appeared again. I had looked him up before and knew he was a painter visiting for work. As he talked about his hometown, he kept inching closer to me. Then he asked if he could smoke weed, which I agreed to, hoping it would make him leave me alone. I pointed out a spot away from the cameras, but instead of leaving, he got too close, smelled my neck, and began to touch me inappropriately. Quickly I pushed him away and sternly warned him not to touch me again. Dropping my cigarette, I reached for my phone to alert my boss. But before I could, the man snatched it from my grasp and sent himself a message. Now he had my number. The first thing he sent was a shocking photo of his altered private part, unlike anything I had ever seen. Following that were unsettling messages and images suggesting what he wanted to do to me, pointing out he knew where I was. At this point, I was terrified and confused about why I hadn't called the police. My boss wasn't responding to my calls, and I was alone, panicking in the back office. Then, I received a video from him. Curiosity got the better of me, and I watched it, only to be horrified by its violent and explicit content. I locked myself in the back room, overwhelmed with fear and tears, until it was time to prepare the morning breakfast for the hotel guests. His messages continued for several days until I finally mustered the courage to inform my boss about the entire ordeal. The man was immediately expelled from the motel and barred from any future stays. The company he was associated with was also banned from making reservations with us. Looking back, I realize I should have called the police right away, but fear held me back. To the terrifying man from Tinder, let's never cross paths again. I'm a 21-year-old girl who likes guys. Back in November 2016, I had a tough time because I broke up with my boyfriend. It took me a whole year, but by October 2017, 
I felt ready to start dating again. So I did something a bit silly and signed up for Tinder again. I had used Tinder before but nothing too weird had happened until this one time at the end of October when I matched with a guy named Dave. Dave seemed nice at first glance, he was funny and polite. We chatted for a couple of weeks and decided to go out on a date. We agreed to meet in the city he had just moved to, which was about a 35 minute drive from where I lived. I arrived at the bar first and waited for him. He was 15 minutes late, but when he showed up, he looked pretty much like his pictures, which made me relieved. However, the moment he started talking, I noticed something off about his voice. It sounded like he was about to cry at any moment. It was odd. Dave had a few tattoos, one of which was the all-seeing eye, often linked to the Illuminati. Trying to lighten the mood, I made a joke about the Illuminati and asked him to share his secrets. He didn't find it funny and snapped at me, asking why I would say something like that in public. I tried to laugh it off but he continued to act strangely. He even mentioned something bizarre about people dying, which left me speechless. About 20 minutes later, I had convinced a couple of my friends to join us at the bar. After my friends arrived, I moved to sit closer to Dave so we could all fit around the table. As soon as I sat down next to him, he put his hand on my knee and squeezed really hard. It wasn't a gentle touch, it was uncomfortable. I told him to back off, and then he leaned in close and said something super weird about liking my kneecaps. Seriously, who says that? By the time my friends decided to leave, Dave had downed seven beers. And mind you, it was just a regular Tuesday night. When I went to pay for my drinks, Dave stood weirdly close behind me. And I noticed he was way too excited, if you get what I mean. I quickly signed off my bill and moved away from him. Just as I was about to say goodbye, it started to pour rain outside. Dave then told me he had walked to the bar and asked if I could give him a lift home. I didn't want to, but I ended up saying yes. During the short drive to his place, he mentioned it wasn't really his house, but his sister's basement where he was staying. When we got there, he tried to kiss me. I turned my head to avoid it, but he grabbed my face and went for a full-on kiss, which I did not want at all. I pushed him away, but he tried again. I had to forcefully tell him to leave my car. Then, out of nowhere, he declared his love for me, saying he fell for me the moment he saw my Tinder pictures and insisted I come in to meet his sister and her husband. I was firm and told him I'd call the cops if he didn't exit the car. He started crying but finally left. And that's the story of one of my weirdest Tinder dates ever. What a strange guy. I matched with a girl on Tinder named Jenna. Jenna and I had our first date on January 26th. She knew that I had recently ended a long-term relationship and that I still talked to my ex, Mary, from time to time. By mid-February, Jenna and I began referring to each other as boyfriend and girlfriend. Three days ago, while I was taking a shower, Jenna went through my phone. She read some old texts between Mary and me. There were some normal chats and some very loving ones from before Jenna and I had started dating or even met. When I finished my shower, I found Jenna packing her stuff and almost out the door, with my phone in her hand. She had sent messages to many people saying things like, I'm apparently an awful person and Mary is a manipulative person. Jenna then got into my Facebook account. She posted messages calling Mary all sorts of bad names and then removed several of my friends from my list. She did the same thing with my Twitter account. I managed to borrow a co-worker's phone to try and reach out to her and to log back into my Facebook. When Jenna found out, she changed the passwords for my accounts and even my email. Later, she told me she wanted to sort things out and suggested meeting at my place. I agreed, hoping to get my phone and passwords back. She returned my phone and insisted I call Mary to cut her off. I had already warned Mary that something like this might happen and asked her to just go along with it. Thanks to our acting skills, we had a very believable fight over the speakerphone for Jenna to hear. After getting my passwords back, I changed them immediately. I told Jenna it was best for her to leave, but she couldn't grasp why I was pushing her out of my life. Jenna went home really upset after our breakup. She began posting and commenting on my Facebook, so I blocked her. I blocked her on everything, but she kept calling me. When I answered, she wouldn't say anything, so I blocked her number too. Then, I started getting repeated calls from a number in Colorado. 
I eventually went to my phone company and changed my number. I also changed my door locks, just in case she had taken a key. The next day, Jenna made a new Facebook page. She called me terrible names and Mary too. She even got into my other Twitter account. I warned her that if she contacted me again or posted about anyone I knew, I'd call the police. Soon after, I got an email about a credit card approval from a bank I don't use. I called the bank and explained the situation. They froze the account. Many of my friends suggested calling the police, and I finally agreed. When the police arrived, they told me Jenna had a record with them, and her real name wasn't even Jenna. It was something else. They gave her a warning for harassing me and said if she tried to contact me again, she'd be arrested. On Monday, I had to call the fraud department to freeze all my accounts and start an investigation. This story might seem short, but it's actually the simplified version of what happened. I'm sharing this because, now that the police are involved, and I've had to change my locks and number, I'm beginning to feel the emotional impact of being mistreated and harassed by someone I was beginning to care for. I'm struggling with how to handle these feelings. I really wish none of this had ever happened. I'm a 22-year-old guy who likes other guys, and I've got a bunch of health issues in my head that make life pretty hard. One of the big ones is BPD, or Borderline Personality Disorder. This means I often feel really paranoid, don't think too highly of myself, and even though I really want people to be close to me, I find it hard to trust anyone. Since I turned 18, I've been using Grindr and lots of other apps for dating. I've met quite a few people through them, so many that I can't even remember all their names. I hope you won't think badly of me for this. This weird story starts around the end of November or the beginning of December last year, and it's been a part of my daily life ever since. One day I got a message on Grindr from someone who didn't have a profile picture or any info about themselves. The message was creepy. It said, I know who you are, and had a photo of me that looked like it was taken from my old Facebook page. My Grindr profile doesn't show my face because I don't want people I know, like my family and friends, to find me on there. I had no clue what to do, so I didn't reply. Nothing happened for a day, and I thought maybe it was just someone messing around. But then I got another message, another... Why are you ignoring me? It said. This time, I replied, because I was starting to feel a bit scared. I tried to act tough, like, so what if you know me? And then I blocked them partly because it was just too weird, and partly because I was really freaked out. For a few days after that, nothing happened, and I started to feel a bit better. But then, while I was at a friend's place, I got another message. This time, it was a text from an unknown number saying, Hey you, why did you block me? Now, I was really worried. I kept thinking about who this could be, how they knew it was me from my grinder profile, and how they got my phone number. I didn't tell my friend what was going on, I just tried to act normal, but he could tell something was up because he kept asking if I was okay and noticed I wasn't looking too good. After that, I kept getting messages from different grinder profiles, all saying things like, I know who you are, don't ignore me, I'll keep coming back. With Christmas coming up, I couldn't handle it anymore. So, I deleted my grinder account, made a new Snapchat, and changed my phone number. I just wanted to have a good time with my family without feeling scared and suspicious of everyone around me. Over Christmas Eve and the days leading to the new year, everything was quiet. I thought maybe the person bothering me had lost interest, which was a relief. But then, in early January, it all started again. This time the messages were on my phone, which was even scarier because I had changed my number, and the number they were coming from seemed different from before. The messages got scarier because they showed that whoever was sending them knew where I was and what I was doing. Like, if I went out to buy stuff, I'd come back, check my phone, and there'd be a message saying they saw me at Harley's shopping center, or commenting on my clothes like, I like your jeans. The messages weren't coming every day anymore, just two or three times a week, but they felt more threatening. It was like the person was trying to show they could reach me no matter where I was. So that's where things stand now. I keep getting these creepy messages, sometimes from different phone numbers. I've tried looking up the numbers on Facebook and Google, but I've found nothing. 
it makes me wonder if they're using some app to hide their real number. I keep thinking, could this be someone I met before? A friend playing a mean joke? Or someone I don't even know who for some reason knows me? I've been told to go to the police, but that's not something I'm comfortable doing. I'm not exactly helpless. I'm six feet tall, weigh around 180 pounds, and have eight years of training in martial arts and boxing. But all that doesn't really help when you have no idea who's after you, why they're doing it, or where they might strike next. It leaves you feeling defenseless and exposed, especially when this person seems to always know your moves. It's really disturbing. I'm at a loss about what to do next. Starting off, I'm a transgender woman. I'm currently not in a relationship, and I'm very open about being trans on all my dating profiles, except for one site called Plenty of Fish. They have a rule against discussing anything related to sex, which they think includes being trans. So I just mentioned that I strongly support transgender rights instead. I got a message from a man who lives about an hour away from me. He was sort of attractive in a way that also made me feel uneasy. There was something about him that didn't sit right with me, but I figured looks aren't everything, so I decided to see where things would go. I found out he smokes cigarettes, but he mentioned he's trying to quit. He said he mostly smokes when he's feeling really stressed or upset. We ended up having a nice chat, and eventually, he asked for my phone number. I gave it to him, mentioning that I was about to get ready for my night classes, so I might not reply quickly. Not long after, I received a text from him, saying it was him from Plenty of Fish. Normally, I would immediately let someone know that I'm a transgender woman, since my dating profile might not make it very clear. I believe in being upfront because I know not everyone is okay with that, and I totally get it if they're not interested. Typically, about 20% of the guys react negatively and end up being blocked. The rest are either immediately inappropriate sending rude messages or pictures, or they're cool with it or just don't respond. However, this time, I was busy getting ready for class and hadn't sent my usual message yet. Just as I was about to send him my usual text explaining that I'm transgender, I received another message from him. Who is this person and why are they paying for your phone? Confused, I asked him how he came across that name. He demanded, just tell me, who is he? I was shocked and realized he must have paid for my personal information from one of those dodgy websites. I replied, to satisfy your curiosity, I'm transgender and that was my name before. I was about to tell you, but you decided to invade my privacy instead. Please just forget my number. What you did is really crossing a line, and I don't want anything to do with you now. He then threatened to visit me, asking if I still lived at my old address, and insisting we talk face to face. I quickly told him, No, I've moved, and I'm busy heading out. You need to stop this. Do not contact me again. He wasn't deterred, and said he'd run a complete background check on me because he felt I had lied to him. I warned him, I'm going to share screenshots of this chat, your profile on Plenty of Fish, and all your photos with my two best friends who work in law enforcement in your area, and with my ex-boyfriend who's also in the sheriff's office. I'm serious. Don't message me again. After that, I didn't hear from him for a couple of weeks. I made sure to keep my home secure, locking all doors and windows. My friends and ex made it a point to check on me now and then. Over time, this whole incident turned into one of those strange stories that you can't help but laugh about, though it still makes you feel a bit uneasy. Then one day, I was pretty sure I saw him at the grocery store near my place. He had dark hair, wore thick glasses, and just gave off a creepy vibe, watching me as I picked out my groceries. I texted my ex about the encounter. Surprisingly, this rekindled something between us and we started seeing each other again casually. He even stayed over a few times each month. However, one evening when I was by myself, I felt really uneasy and kept smelling cigarette smoke. I lived in a small apartment building with three units. We didn't share air systems, but sometimes smells would drift from one apartment to another. I don't smoke, and because of my asthma, I'm really sensitive to the smell of smoke. The apartment had a standalone air conditioning unit, and I thought it might be pulling in air from a neighbor's place, maybe a visitor who was smoking a lot. So, I turned it off. I had a sign language, ASL video assignment due the next day, so I stayed up all night working on it, signing the same story repeatedly until it felt more like a dance. My cat was acting really strange during my recording, making me start over a few times. By 7am, I finally finished the video, submitted it, 
and went to bed after making sure everything was locked up tight. After school the next day, where I found out I got an A on my video, I stopped for some groceries. When I got home, I noticed something odd that I had missed in my rush earlier. Each apartment had a tiny garden by the porch. Mine was just gravel and some stepping stones the previous tenant had laid down. Neat and tidy except for a pile of cigarette butts dumped right in front of my bedroom window. It looked like someone had emptied their car's ashtray there. At first I didn't think much of it and just started to clean it up. While I was sweeping, my elderly neighbor came out and asked if my boyfriend had managed to contact me. He mentioned seeing a young man hanging around my front porch for a few hours the previous night, thinking he might be my boyfriend since he'd seen him around before. The description matched the guy from the grocery store. Dark hair, thick glasses, always smoking. I immediately contacted my on and off ex, and the police got involved, taking statements and screenshots of our conversations. Not long after, I moved out of state for reasons unrelated to this incident and legally changed my name, making sure the records were sealed. I've stopped giving out my phone number directly, advising others to use a messaging app until they really know someone. It's shocking how easily and cheaply someone can dig up your personal information just from your phone number. Stay safe out there. A few years back, after ending a relationship, I found myself with a bit of free time and a desire to meet new folks. I wasn't really looking for anything serious, I just wanted to get out there and maybe go on a few dates. That's when I met JB. He seemed friendly, and we decided to meet up in a nearby city. Our first date went well, and after saying our goodbyes, we planned a few more outings. Eventually, these plans led me to his apartment, located in a part of the city I was familiar with from my student days. This familiarity gave me a sense of security, especially knowing he had roommates who would be around, so I wouldn't be completely alone with him. We spent some time downstairs watching TV, and when his roommates returned and started cooking their dinner, JB suggested we finish the episode upstairs before I had to leave to catch my bus. His room was tiny, with just a single bed and nowhere else to sit. He lay down on the bed, and I perched awkwardly at the edge. He urged me to move closer, and I reluctantly complied. Then he mentioned he couldn't see well and suggested I lie down too. Despite feeling uncomfortable, I figured nothing would happen since we hadn't even kissed. But at that moment, I wished I had just left. Suddenly, without any warning or even a hint of affection, JB grabbed my arm and tried to force my hand down his shorts. That was my breaking point. Thankfully, I had my handbag with me, which I clutched tightly. In a swift motion, I jumped off the bed, slung my bag over my shoulder and dashed downstairs with him trailing behind, apologizing profusely and begging me not to leave. He was barefoot and unaware that I knew the city well. I quickly lost him and took a different route than the one we had arrived by. I was panicking at the bus stop, frantically calling for a ride home, hoping he wouldn't find me. Eventually, I made it home safely and never saw him again. However, that wasn't the last I heard from JB. After that night, he went silent for a while. But then he started sending me messages, pleading for another chance to meet up. I ignored all his attempts to reach out. After JB stopped messaging me for a while, I got curious and checked his Facebook. Turns out he had quickly moved in with a new girlfriend shortly after our awkward encounter. It all happened so fast, it made me wonder if he was already with her when we met. But I guess I'll never know for sure. Fast forward six months, I hadn't been active on dating sites trying to avoid any more weird situations. Then, out of the blue in January, JB messages me. He mentioned he had broken up with his girlfriend and wanted to meet for a coffee and chat. Feeling a bit lonely, I entertained the idea but insisted we meet in a public place. He agreed to that. We planned to meet one evening after I finished work, but then he messaged saying he couldn't make it and suggested I come over to his place instead. I wasn't about to do that, so I went home. For the next six months, he kept trying to make plans, always trying to guilt me into agreeing, then changing the plans at the last minute, leading me to cancel. It seemed like a small thing until around June, when I was texting a friend from the next town over. Let's call this friend M. M had shared stories about a crazy ex-girlfriend he had. M's name was common, but spelled in a unique way. One night, while relaxing at home, I received a WhatsApp message from an unknown number mentioning M by his uniquely spelled name. 
I was alarmed and quickly informed M, suspecting his ex might be trying to scare me. I can't recall the exact words of the message, but it was threatening enough to make me ask who it was. The reply was cryptic, suggesting M would know who it was. M was just as alarmed, and then I started receiving calls from this number, with the caller hanging up every time I answered. My anxiety spiked, and by the next day, I was a mess. The random calls continued even at work. Eventually, I confided in my cousin about everything, and she decided to call the number. To our shock, it was JB's voicemail that greeted her. She left him a stern warning to stop contacting me, threatening to involve the police if he didn't. Later on, I saw on his Facebook that he was planning to move back to his home country. Hopefully that meant I'd never have to encounter him again. While it might not have been the most terrifying situation, it really unsettled me and played on my mind for a long time. A bit ago, I figured it was time to start meeting new folks again. I wasn't exactly on the hunt for a boyfriend or anything, but trying to find someone in bars just wasn't cutting it for me. Like many single girls in college, I ended up getting a dating app. I ended up chatting with quite a few people on there and it helped me build up the courage to actually go out on a date from time to time. I didn't actually meet most of these guys in real life, but there were a handful I did meet. For the most part, these dates didn't really lead anywhere, but there was one guy who turned out to be a bigger headache than the others. His name was Alex, and we planned to go out for dinner. He mentioned this fancy place halfway between where we both lived and wanted to take me there. However, when the day arrived, he ghosted me and didn't pick up his phone. He reached out the next day, claiming he was held up at work and had left his phone at home. Sounded like a bunch of excuses to me, but he wanted to try for another day, and for some reason, I agreed. When the day for our rescheduled date arrived, he suggested I come to his place first, and from there, he'd drive us to the restaurant where he had made reservations. He kept telling me to come hungry and not to eat anything before our date, hinting at the big portions served at the restaurant. Meeting up at someone's house or getting into their car isn't something I'm comfortable with on a first date. But after chatting for over a week, I thought, why not? But then, he asked me to park in a lot down the street from his place. Which I found odd. Maybe he had a small driveway. But the thing is, I never told him what my car looked like. Yet, as I pulled into the lot, he was right behind me. Texting me he was parked just a couple of spaces away. That was the first red flag for me. Ignoring my gut feeling, I got into his car and we set off. I wasn't exactly sure where we were since I'm not too familiar with the area. I knew the name of the restaurant and that it was supposed to be a short drive away on a main road. However, after about 25 minutes of driving on some dark secluded road, I started to wonder. I finally asked him, where are we going exactly? He then admitted he hadn't been completely honest. When he called the restaurant for reservations, he was told they had moved and was given a rough idea of the new location instead of an exact address. My heart sank when I realized we had passed the intersection he mentioned about five minutes ago, and I noticed he wasn't even using his GPS for directions, even though it was on. That was the second red flag. So I decided to open up my own GPS on my phone, feeling a bit uneasy about the whole situation. I was trying to look up the restaurant myself, which was already a bad sign. That was the third red flag right there. At this point, I realized I might not have made the best decision sticking around, but I chose to stay anyway. We spent some time chatting and getting to know each other, despite the odd vibe he gave off. When he admitted he couldn't find the restaurant, he shrugged it off, saying he knew another spot and drove us even deeper into the night, eventually stopping by a trail leading into the woods. He mentioned we were going stargazing. The place he took me to was actually quite nice, but as we walked through the woods, he kept making jokes about not being a murderer, which wasn't very reassuring. He also made me promise not to run off with his car. That was red flag number four. The more we talked, the more I noticed he had a habit of lying. He'd tell these elaborate stories, only to reveal he was just joking. At first, it was kind of amusing like when he claimed to have drunkenly gotten a piercing in a rather sensitive area. But as the night went on, it became clear he wasn't serious about anything he said. I realized I didn't know anything real about him at all. That brought me to red flag number five. 
Later, he mentioned going back to his place to watch a movie. But halfway there, he changed his mind and stopped the car at a park. He suggested we hang out there instead, and started daring me to do inappropriate things, asking me personal questions that were none of his business. Then, out of nowhere, he wanted to know if I was planning to kiss him by the end of the night, saying he needed to apply chapstick first. And there I was, rummaging through my purse for chapstick, while he made it awkwardly obvious that he was touching himself. All of this just didn't sit right with me. I let him know straight up that I didn't have any chapstick. But then he tried another move, suggesting I should come closer in a way that was anything but respectful. I made it clear that I wasn't okay with what he was suggesting. Despite that, he tried to pull me closer by grabbing me, which made me even more uncomfortable. I reiterated that I wasn't interested in getting intimate with him, especially not on a first date. Yet he didn't seem to take my refusal seriously and suggested something even more inappropriate as if it was some kind of compromise. That was the absolute last straw for me. Alarm bells were ringing loud in my head by then. I was really upset, especially considering he had previously told me how much he disapproved of men who pressured women, claiming to be someone who respected boundaries. His behavior at the stargazing spot, where he had been careful not to sit too close, now felt like a complete act. It was as if he had suddenly become a completely different person. I told him off, saying that pressuring me wasn't going to change my mind, and reminded him of his earlier claims of being a respectful guy. He then made a ridiculous excuse, suggesting I was just intimidated, which was absurd. I stood my ground, refusing his advances, which seemed to frustrate him. I was desperately trying to think of a way to get him to take me back to my car, when he suddenly pretended to receive an urgent text from his uncle claiming he needed to go home immediately. At that point, I was completely over the situation. I disliked dishonesty intensely. If he wasn't enjoying our time together, he could have simply said so. Instead, he chose to lie and act in a way that contradicted everything he had said about himself. It just made no sense. To top it off, when he dropped me off at my car in a dark parking lot late at night, he left before I even got out of the car, showing a complete lack of concern for my safety. It was clear there wouldn't be another date. But here's the thing that really got to me later on. I drove past the original location of the restaurant we were supposed to go to, and it was still there, unchanged, open as usual, and very close to his house. So, it made me wonder, where was he really planning to take me that night? The whole experience with Alex from Bumble left me feeling very uneasy. In 2015, when I was around 20, I used to use Tinder quite a bit. There were times when dates didn't go well, or I'd end up waiting for someone who never showed up. One weekend, I went to see some college buddies in Bloomington to relax and have fun. I thought it might be a good chance to meet a girl and spend some time together. I can't really recall her name, but we matched on Tinder and chatted for a day before deciding to meet at her place that night. I told my friends I was heading out since her apartment was just a five minute drive from where they lived. I hopped in my car, set up my GPS, and soon arrived at her apartment complex, texting her to ask which unit was hers. I wandered around the complex, trying to find the correct building number until I reached where she was supposed to live. I messaged her to come down and let me in, confident I was at the right spot. She replied with a sure, and I waited outside, probably for about five minutes. It's important to note that it was around 10 p.m. in the middle of winter. As I lifted my head from my phone, I started to notice something odd. I saw a window on the ground floor open slightly, and it looked like four people were peeking out at me. I messaged the girl again, asking where she was. She replied that the main door to her building was unlocked, and her apartment was the first one on the right after you enter. Heading to the door, I found it odd but true that it was unlocked. Once inside and the main door closed behind me, I turned left. But then I heard a whisper from behind a door saying, Shh, he's outside. That moment, I realized I was standing near the same window where I'd seen those people looking at me. A strong feeling told me I needed to get out of there quickly, fearing something bad might happen. I left the building, noticed the lights by the window were now off, and ran back to my car, driving away as fast as I could. Back at my friend's place, I shared what happened, but they didn't seem to understand the seriousness of it. As the evening went on, 
we relaxed and had some beers. Before going to sleep, I received a text saying, Where did you go? I've been waiting for you all night. I immediately blocked the number and tried to forget about the night by going to bed. So, a word of advice to anyone using dating sites, always choose to meet up in a public place. This whole thing started back when I was 19. I'm not exactly a head turner, so dating was always a bit of a struggle for me, leading me to try my luck on Tinder. For the first few months, I didn't really hit it off with anyone, until this blonde lady named Katie sent me a message. She was pretty, so much so that I initially thought she must be a fake account. It took another message from her three days later to make me reconsider, since fake accounts typically don't bother to follow up. Curious. I decided to respond and took a closer look at her profile, which seemed normal enough to convince me she wasn't a bot. We spent about a month chatting before she suggested I should come visit her. The idea was daunting since she lived a good eight hours drive away, but I found myself really liking her and had been toying with the idea of visiting her myself. After a bit of persuasion on her part, I agreed to make the trip. By then, I had no reason to doubt her identity. We had been video chatting bi-weekly and calling each other almost every day. I figured I was just incredibly lucky. However, things started to feel a bit off as I was on my way to meet her. She messaged me repeatedly, checking on my whereabouts and ensuring I was still on my way. If I took longer than half an hour to reply, she'd send a bunch of texts that seemed annoyed. I brushed it off, thinking she was just anxious about our meeting, and I was pretty anxious too, so it seemed understandable. Finding her house was a challenge. The directions she gave me led me down a confusing path of gravel and dirt roads, surrounded by thick woods. It was still broad daylight when I finally saw the house. It looked old, with one of the upstairs windows boarded up, but it didn't seem deserted, just dilapidated. Katie's bright red car, the one she'd often mentioned in our chats, was parked out front as I arrived. I messaged her to let her know I had made it, and she replied with a simple smiley face. Stepping out of my car, I felt eyes on me from a window on the second floor. It was unsettling, but I brushed it off, thinking maybe her dad was checking me out. She had mentioned that her dad sometimes visited, so I didn't think much of it and knocked on the door. Katie greeted me with a smile and an unexpected kiss, then led me inside. We settled on the couch, and as we chatted about her plans for our visit, I casually brought up her dad's presence. I didn't know your dad was here. Was that supposed to be a surprise? I asked. Katie looked genuinely confused and told me her dad wasn't there. Thinking she was playing a joke, I mentioned seeing him at the window. Her reaction was immediate fear. She insisted we needed to leave immediately. We rushed to our cars, and as I pressed her for answers, Katie explained she had been alone until I arrived. I called the police, and while explaining the situation, Katie gasped and pointed to the window where I'd seen the figure before. Now I could see him clearly, an older emaciated man staring back at us. He disappeared from the window after noticing our attention. The police arrived after a tense half hour, during which Katie was visibly upset, regretting not locking her doors. After the police arrived, they split up. Some questioned us while others searched the house. They found the back door wide open but no sign of the intruder, concluding he must have fled into the woods. Katie, too scared to stay alone, asked me to spend the night. I agreed, sleeping on the couch downstairs, near the room where we saw the stranger. Katie, seeking some form of protection, brought out her dad's shotgun, a weapon she'd never intended to use. I assured Katie it was okay, believing the intruder had left, but she felt more secure having the shotgun nearby. I was grateful for her insistence later on. That night, while Katie had managed to doze off, I was still up, glued to the TV. Suddenly I caught the sound of a doorknob turning from the kitchen. My fear had evaporated, replaced by annoyance. I turned on the kitchen light, aimed the shotgun at the door, and there he was, the same man from before, right behind the glass door, looking as surprised as us to find the door locked. After a moment, he turned and disappeared into the woods. I immediately woke Katie, explained what happened, and we called the police again. They arrived and combed through the woods but found no one. They suggested we find a safer place to spend the rest of the night. Katie decided to stay with a friend, and I planned to head home. 
I left shortly after Katie. While sharing the night's events with my brother over the phone, my car's headlights illuminated the figure of that same man, lurking at the corner of the house, silently observing me. I didn't hesitate. I sped away and chose not to call the police again. However, I did message Katie to inform her, and she said she would contact the police. It seemed like Katie never dared to return to that house by herself after that night. And honestly, I couldn't blame her one bit. That encounter remains one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. In 2011, a few months after ending a very difficult relationship, my friends convinced me to start dating again. To give it a try, I created a profile on a dating site called Plenty of Fish. I was overwhelmed by the number of messages I got in just a few hours. Most messages were simple greetings, or people looking for a quick meetup, which wasn't what I wanted. So I ignored those. About a week later, I got a message from a guy who lived about an hour away. He seemed nice and was good looking, so I responded. Our chat was light and easy at first. He suggested meeting for coffee, and without thinking too much about it, I agreed. But then things started to get strange. He became very insistent about when we could meet for coffee. I explained that I didn't have a car and might need to borrow my mom's. He offered to pick me up, but that made me uncomfortable. His next message was chilling. He said, your town can't be that big. I bet if I knocked on a few doors, someone would tell me where you live. I was shocked and responded, are you serious? That's really creepy. This angered him, and he sent several messages after that, threatening me. He said things like, I could make you disappear and nobody would look for you. You're just a slut. I could throw you in a well and you'd never be found. Terrified, I begged him to leave me alone. He replied with a message saying he knew where I lived and that it wouldn't be hard to find me in such a small town. That was the last straw for me. I blocked him, reported his profile to the dating site, and deleted my account. For weeks after, I was anxious and scared he might actually come to find me. This experience with a threatening guy on plenty of fish was one of the most frightening moments of my life. Please, for your own safety, be cautious online. I've had some really strange and scary experiences, but there's one that really sticks out. First things first, I'm a guy, and I kind of let people know I'm gay, but not too openly. Now let's get into my very first time using Grindr. This all went down about two years back, when I finally got my own phone. I was pretty late to the whole phone game compared to most folks my age. At the beginning, having a phone didn't really change much for me. I had spent so many years without one while everyone else had theirs, so I wasn't glued to it right away. Maybe it's because I didn't have a lot of friends to message. Or maybe I was just used to not having a phone. I'm not the kind of person who makes new friends easily, so it's rare for me to meet and get close to new people. But after a few months with my phone, I started checking out apps like Tinder. For someone like me, who finds it tough to talk to people face to face, chatting online was way easier. But I never really talked to anyone on there for more than a few weeks, because I was too scared to meet up in real life. After a while, I figured out what most people were using apps like Tinder for. They were all just looking for a quick hookup. When I found out about Grindr, I thought it might be a good chance to meet others like me, especially since I was still figuring out my feelings about being gay. I thought Grindr would be like Tinder, but for gay guys. Boy, was I wrong. On Tinder, people around my age would act like they were interested in you. They'd start a conversation, ask about you, then slowly start talking about sex. But on Grindr, there was no beating around the bush. The guys there were upfront about what they wanted, and they didn't hesitate to tell you. Plus, they were all a lot older. I knew I'd meet guys a few years older than me, but I had to lie about my age to make an account. I know, it was a dumb move, but finding someone who wasn't 10 years older than me was pretty rare. As my story unfolds, the eerie atmosphere and unsettling encounters on Grindr take center stage, marking the beginning of a series of horror-filled events that would forever change my perspective on online dating. The tone becomes increasingly serious, emphasizing the horror lurking within seemingly innocent interactions and showcasing the naive curiosity that led me into a world far more sinister than I could have imagined. So, when I actually met someone who seemed different, someone who didn't just jump straight into talking about dirty stuff or where to meet, 
I was really taken aback in a good way. This guy, let's call him Mark, said he was 18 and lived on the far side of the city, close enough that we could meet if we wanted, but far enough that I felt a bit safer. Plus, he was kind of cute. Mark and I hit it off pretty quickly. He was funny, we liked the same stuff. He never brought up sex, and whenever I was feeling down or had something bothering me, he was all ears and gave solid advice. As we kept chatting for more than a month, I started to really trust him. One night, I just felt like I had to be honest with him and tell him I wasn't really 18 like I said on my profile. I thought, if there was any chance for us, even though we hadn't really talked about being together or anything, I was just hoping, foolishly, maybe he should know. He took it well, said he kind of guessed because I talked about school a lot but he didn't care, since he was just a few years older. After that, it felt like we got even closer. We talked every single day, and I found myself sharing more about my life. Like what I was doing, where I was going. So when I mentioned I was heading to the mall with my friend Alex to pick up some Christmas gifts, it didn't seem odd at all. Oh, and something important to know. Back then, Grindr had this feature that showed how far away people were from you. Alex and I were just enjoying our day, shopping and having fun. Quick note. Alex was one of the few who knew I was gay, and I kinda had a big crush on him. Don't ask me to explain it. Eventually, we decided to grab something to eat at the food court. While we were there, I checked my phone and, of course, Grinder. Mark's profile showed he was really close, just a few hundred feet away. That was strange since we were usually miles apart, but I brushed it off, thinking, it's a busy mall after all. We messaged a bit, joking around. Enjoying stalking me at the mall, I teased. I was, but your friends caught my eye now, he joked back. Haha, <laughs> very funny, I replied. Just kidding, you're the one I'm interested in, he said. I didn't think much of it then, so Alex and I just continued with our day as usual. But that's when things started to get weird. Mark's messages became more frequent, and he seemed to know exactly where we were in the mall. It was like he was watching us, tracking our every move through the crowd. The light-hearted feeling of our earlier chats was replaced by a growing sense of unease. This was supposed to be a fun day out, but now there was a shadow hanging over it, a reminder of the unseen eyes that seemed to follow me around. The horror of the situation was slowly beginning to dawn on me as I realized that online connections could lead to real-world dangers far closer than I ever imagined. But thinking about that conversation now, it sends chills down my spine. Even though we were joking, Mark never said he wasn't following me, and the app showed he was definitely there. He could guess what I looked like from my grinder picture, so it's not hard to believe he was watching me and my friends while we shopped and ate. Then came New Year's Eve, and by that time, Mark and I had been talking for ages. That night, I was with Alex and my two other buddies, celebrating at one of their places. Our friend, whose house we were at, let's call him Eric, had managed to get some alcohol and took some beers from his parents' stash. So, of course, we were pretty drunk. For a bit of background, Eric's house was on the complete opposite side of town from where I lived, and my parents had dropped me off there to stay the night. We kept on drinking, having a loud, wild time, doing stupid stuff. The TV countdown to midnight was just a few minutes away, so we tried to calm down a bit, sprawling out on the couches to watch. I was sitting next to Alex, with another friend on his other side while Eric sat on a separate small sofa. A lot of things contributed to what happened when the countdown reached zero. A lot of it was because I had drunk too much, but also being so close to each other after all that roughhousing, plus my huge crush on Alex. So when the countdown ended and I saw Alex looking at me, I drunkenly tried to kiss him, just as our other friends started cheering for the new year. Alex pushed me away immediately, shouting, What the hell? He was really mad but he didn't try to hit me, which I guess was something. I tried to explain, but he wasn't listening, just told me to go away and insulted me. By then, Eric and our other friend were quiet, just watching us. Feeling drunk, ashamed, and hurt, I just stood up and left. Eric tried to stop me, but the others didn't say anything, so I kept going. I mentioned before, I lived far away, so walking home wasn't the best plan, especially drunk with snow everywhere and in the freezing cold. After a bit, I found a bus shelter at an intersection to try and warm up. While trying to warm up, I checked Grinder on my phone. Since I'd been busy getting drunk earlier, 
I hadn't talked to Mark, but then I started telling him everything, even that I might freeze to death out there. He tried to make me feel better, and then offered to drive me home, saying he was close by and didn't want me to freeze trying to walk home. I'm not proud of it, but I was so out of it, I agreed and sent him where I was. What happened next was the most terrifying experience of my life, and probably nothing will ever scare me more. After a little while, a truck slowly drove up to the bus shelter where I was waiting. I stood there in the cold, not totally sure if the person in the truck was Mark. But then the door swung open, and I took it as my signal to get in. Climbing into the big truck took some effort. In the dim light inside, I couldn't get a clear look at the driver right away. But when I did, it was obvious he was not the young guy from the profile picture. This man was much older, easily around 50, with a face marked by deep lines, gray stubble, and thinning hair. He greeted me with a quiet hi and a handshake that made my hand feel tiny in his large, rough one. He was a big man, clearly strong, possibly from a job like construction. As we drove, we tried making small talk, but the awkwardness was palpable, and soon he fell silent. It didn't take long for me to realize we were heading in the completely wrong direction from my house. Trying to lighten the mood, I joked, Seems like I forgot to mention I live the other way. He just hummed in response, without any sign of turning around. I can give you the address, I offered, hoping to guide him. He glanced at me but kept driving. Now, I was truly worried. I fumbled for my phone, intending to find my location, but he suddenly asked for the address. His request to pull over so I could get directions on my phone was met with a mumble, but he did stop in a church parking lot I recognized and turned off the engine. My heart was racing as I pretended to search on my phone, my other hand inching towards the door handle. My plan was to escape, but I discovered the door was locked. Then, out of nowhere, I felt a massive blow to my head, causing a ringing in my ears and dizzying my senses even further. Somehow, I managed to unlock the door and tumble out of the truck, dropping my phone in the process. Disoriented, I picked up my phone, now with a shattered screen, and tried to get away as fast as I could, despite my legs barely supporting me. I could hear Mark shouting and the truck starting up again. Desperately, I tried to run, but my legs were shaky and uncooperative. I knew Nick's house wasn't too far from the church, and with every ounce of strength I pushed myself to move faster. After a clumsy fall and a struggle to get back up, I finally found my legs responding more effectively. But by then, Mark had caught up, driving his truck alongside me with the windows down. He was shouting apologies, urging me to get back into the truck. But then, he made a bold move, driving right in front of me, nearly hitting me and jumped out. I was sure he was going to attack me again. But as my head cleared more with each passing second, and my legs finally started to cooperate, I managed to dodge him and ran as fast as I could out of the parking lot and down the street. I stumbled a few times but kept enough distance between us. Rushing along the sidewalk, I tried to figure out how to get home without leading Mark right to where we were staying. Hearing the truck engine behind me, I knew I couldn't outrun him on the streets. Desperately, I veered off into a park covered in snow, hoping to lose him. The park would lead me to the wrong road for Nick's house, but I had a plan. I guessed Mark would try to drive around the park to catch me on the other side. So after a bit, I doubled back to the sidewalk and sprinted towards Nick's place, taking extra care to loop around and approach from the backyards to avoid being seen. Finally reaching Nick's house, I banged on the back door as hard as I could. To my relief, it was Alex who opened the door, not Nick. For a moment, I feared he would just shut me out, but he didn't. Despite everything, he let me in. Inside, Alex woke Nick up to help me clean up. It was only then, in the bathroom, that I saw the extent of my injuries. My head was covered in dried blood, but there was no actual cut on my ear. My elbows, knees, and forehead were badly scraped. The adrenaline and alcohol must have numbed the pain because I hadn't realized how badly I was hurt. After getting cleaned up and changing into some dry clothes from Nick, the reality of what happened hit me. I broke down, sobbing in the living room, with everyone watching awkwardly. When they asked what happened, I lied, saying some guys tried to jump me. I couldn't bear to tell them the truth about Mark and the grinder meetup gone horribly wrong. It was around 4 a.m. by the time I felt safe enough to try and sleep. The next day, despite the ordeal, 
we had to clean up Nick's house before his parents returned. Despite everything, Alex chose to stay close, sleeping on the floor near me, which felt like a small gesture of friendship. I'm no storyteller, so forgive me if this account is a bit rough around the edges. This is the first time I've shared the true story of what happened that night, and likely the last. Thanks for hearing me out. I never thought having someone follow me could be so terrifying. I was 18 then, and it happened four years ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I had just started college, and my girlfriend broke up with me. I felt really sad. I sent her many texts, but she never replied. I tried calling her too, but it always went straight to voicemail. All I wanted was to fix things with her, but she never got back to me or answered my calls. My brother, who was 27, told me to forget about her and move on. He suggested I try dating online. I wasn't keen on the idea of online dating because I've heard stories about people pretending to be someone else. But after thinking it over, I decided to try it. I downloaded Tinder and set up my profile. I waited for someone to message me for about a day, but nobody did. I was about to log off when suddenly someone messaged me. The message was simple. Hey, what's up? So I replied, not much. You? While waiting for her reply, I checked her profile. Let's call her Emma for privacy. Emma had blonde hair and blue eyes, and we lived close to each other. My first thought was, wow, this beautiful girl messaged me. Just as I was thinking that, I got another message from her. She said, you look really handsome, want to meet? I replied, I'd love to meet. She quickly messaged back asking, when do you want to meet? I asked when she was free and she said tomorrow. We agreed to meet the next day, but we're unsure where. How about the coffee shop nearby in the morning? She suggested. I agreed, saying it sounded good and that I'd see her tomorrow. We stopped chatting after that. I went to bed feeling great. The next morning, I got ready and drove to the coffee shop. I messaged her to say I was at the coffee shop, and she texted back, Okay, I'll be there in one minute. I just replied with a simple okay, found a table and sat down to wait. She showed up soon after and we really hit it off. We found out we liked a lot of the same things, like playing video games and going on road trips. After our date we said goodbye and by the time I got home, she had already sent me a message saying she missed me. Our next date was set for three days later, on the day I got ready and went to meet her. But she seemed different this time. Not mean, but just… off as if she was hiding something. I asked if something was wrong, but she said no. After the date, we said goodbye again. As soon as I got home, she called, insisting she wanted to give me a gift next time we met. It was odd, but I agreed. Then, right after we hung up, she called again, asking why I had hung up. I explained, thinking she had finished talking. She then asked me to stay on the phone with her all night. I said I couldn't because of my classes the next day, but she ignored me and kept talking, asking personal questions. I tried to end the call, saying I needed sleep, but she wouldn't let me hang up. She insisted I keep talking to her all through the night. Eventually, I fell asleep out of exhaustion. The next morning, I woke up to a ton of messages from her, one even threatening to break into my house and kill me if I didn't reply. I was shocked and scared. That's when I decided to end things with her. But that's when she started stalking me. She moved closer to my place and even transferred to my college. She followed me everywhere, always a few feet behind, not attending her classes but just watching me with a cold stare. She would even stand outside my apartment door, trying to peek inside. Once, she attempted to break in. I called the police multiple times, but they said they couldn't do much without evidence. That's when I decided to get a restraining order. Even after I got the order, she didn't stop. She continued following me and even tackled me once. I was fed up and called the police to have her arrested for not obeying the restraining order. While talking to the police, I got a call from a number I didn't recognize. I asked the police to wait and answered the call. It was Emma. Her voice sounded really scary, saying things like, If I can't have you, nobody will. I shouted back, warning her that she would be arrested if she kept this up. But right after we hung up, Emma came to my place with a huge knife in her hand. Even though I am a guy, I was really scared. 
Emma looked wild. Her hair was a mess. Her eyes were red, and she looked like she hadn't cleaned herself in days. She screamed, If I can't have you, nobody can, and charged at me with the knife. I managed to move out of her way, but she still cut my cheek. I ran into another room, locked the door, and called the police again, telling them what was happening. Emma lost her mind outside the door, stabbing it with her knife and screaming crazy things. Luckily, the police arrived in about 10 minutes. They grabbed Emma and I came out of the room. Her eyes were full of hate as they took her away. She yelled, I'll kill you when I get out. There was a court case and Emma was put in jail for breaking and entering and trying to kill me. After that, I stopped using dating apps. I called the police recently to check on Emma and they said she's not doing well. She's still fixated on me, keeping a journal with plans to kidnap and kill me. After hearing that, I moved to a different state far away from her. I really hope she doesn't do this to someone else when she gets out. So, to Emma, my obsessive ex-girlfriend, I hope I never see you again. I usually take care when I date people from the internet. I chat with them until I feel okay, meet them in a place where many people are around, and tell my friends where I will be. Most of the time, these dates are fun or just okay. I never felt scared. I even made some good friends. Some people, I never see again. No problem, no trouble. Very simple. Not long ago I met a man on a dating site called POF. We talked a lot in the app, and then on the phone for many hours. He seemed nice, so we decided to meet. He lived in a town about 45 minutes away from me. A place I barely knew, so I was not familiar with it at all. We thought about me staying over and we planned to have some drinks. I thought about booking a hotel room for myself so I wouldn't have to stay at his house right away. For some reason I stopped thinking clearly because we left my car near a park. I had no idea how to find it again because he drove through many streets to get to his house and he told me to hide in the back of his van because it was a small town and he didn't want people to see me. I don't know why I didn't just go back to my car then. He also took my phone and put it in a box to hide where it was. I should have realized that was a bad sign. I don't know why, but based on our talks, I thought maybe it was some kind of strange game he was playing. He even made it seem like that when we talked before I left my town. When we got to his house, everything seemed normal. We watched movies, talked, and had dinner. But then, he started to act weird. He asked me many questions in a way that made me feel stupid. He didn't stop moving around, smoked a lot, and was just too intense. I started to feel uncomfortable. I even said maybe he should take me back to my car and I could go home. He didn't take me seriously. He said I could take a taxi if I really wanted to leave. But I didn't know how to explain to the taxi driver where my car was. I got my phone back and messaged a friend to be ready to help me if things got worse. I thought if my friend came, I could find my car from a certain point. Things got a bit better after that. I decided to just sleep and leave in the morning. And that's what I did. I got home safely. We kept talking after that, on the phone and through messages. We both said it was a weird night, but not on purpose. He said sorry, so we decided to meet again. This time, it was much better. I felt safe and we laughed a lot. It was a good time. I even stayed over by choice, not because I felt I had to. He offered to get my pillow from my bag for me. When he left to grab something from the other room, my makeup bag accidentally fell out. This seemed important later. He picked it up, put it back, and told me it had fallen. I was already half asleep when this happened. The next morning he drove me back to my car. We didn't talk much after that day. I was busy being part of a wedding and had a lot to do. In the evening he sent me a message, and I told him I'd call him back later because I was occupied. I didn't hear from him after that. So when I was free around 2 a.m., I texted him to see if he was still up for a chat. This wasn't unusual for us, but this time he got very angry. He accused me of preparing some sort of script for him and questioned what I really wanted from him. I was confused and told him we had agreed to start as friends and get to know each other. He then insulted me, saying it was dumb to carry a makeup bag around as some kind of trick. He also thought it was suspicious that I said I would call him later, even though he knew I was busy. All I could think about was how easy it would be to just walk away from this mess. A week later, while I was at work, 
I got a voicemail from him demanding I call him back. My office has poor reception, and I didn't see any missed call, just a voicemail notification. When I tried to listen to it later, the message had disappeared. I was sure I saved it, but when I checked, it was gone. I guessed it was him because something similar happened with another message he left. In that message, he said terrible things. He accused me of trying to gather evidence at his place to use against him and insulted me harshly. He threatened me, saying I deserved to be afraid, and that I was trapping myself in a prison of my own making. He even threatened physical violence if I tried to investigate him further. That was the last I heard from him, thankfully. He doesn't know much about me, not even where I live. I've never experienced anything like this before, and I'm not sure what to do next. I just hope it doesn't get worse. I'm a young man, 22 years old, and life has been tough for me. I've been struggling with a lot of mental health issues and problems with drugs. The biggest challenge I face every day is my borderline personality disorder, or BPD for short. It makes me feel really scared of things that might not happen. I don't feel good about myself, and even though I really want people to care about me, I find it hard to trust them. Ever since I turned 18, I've used apps like Grindr to meet people. I've met a lot of people through it, so many that I can't remember all their names. I hope you won't think badly of me for this. This scary thing started happening around the end of November or beginning of December last year. It hasn't stopped and it's a part of my life every day now. One day, I got a message on Grindr from someone who didn't show their face or any information about themselves. The message was creepy. It just said, I know who you are. And there was a picture of me. I think they got the picture from my old Facebook because I don't show my face on Grindr. I like to keep a low profile there because I don't want my family or friends to find out. I didn't know what to do, so I just didn't reply. Nothing happened for a day, and I thought maybe it was just a joke. But then I got another message asking, Are you ignoring me? I was really scared but tried to act tough and said, Yeah, whatever, you know who I am. And then I blocked them. For a few days, everything was quiet and I started to feel a bit better. But then, while I was at a friend's house, I got a text from a number I didn't know. It said, Hey you, why did you block me? Now I was really scared. I couldn't stop thinking about who this could be, why they were doing this, how they knew it was me from Grindr, and how they got my phone number. I didn't tell my friend about the message. I just tried to act normal, but I was feeling really sick and scared. My friend kept asking if I was okay because he could see something was wrong. After that, I kept getting messages from different accounts on Grindr, all saying things like, I know who you are, don't ignore me, I'll keep coming back. It was almost Christmas, and I just couldn't handle it anymore. The fear and stress were too much, and I felt like I was trapped in a nightmare that wouldn't end. So, I decided to get rid of my Grindr profile, set up a new Snapchat, and change my phone number. I was supposed to be enjoying the holidays with my family, not feeling scared and doubting everyone around me. The rest of December was quiet. I thought maybe the person bothering me had lost interest, which was a relief. But then, in January, it all started again. This time it was even scarier because I had a new phone number, and the messages were coming from a different number than before. The messages were more frightening this time. They didn't threaten to hurt me but it was clear they were following me. After I went shopping, I'd get a message saying something like, I saw you at Harley Shopping Center today, or I like your jeans. It felt like they were watching me all the time. The messages don't come every day now, just two or three times a week, but each one feels like a threat, reminding me they can reach me anytime, anywhere. That's where I'm at now, still getting these creepy texts from different numbers. I've tried looking up the numbers online, but I find nothing. I wonder if they're using some kind of app to hide their real number. I can't figure out who it could be. Maybe someone I met before, a friend playing a bad joke, or someone I've never met who somehow knows me. I don't want to go to the police. It's just not what I do. Even though I'm a big guy with lots of training in martial arts and boxing, it doesn't help when you don't know who you're up against or why they're targeting you. It leaves you feeling weak and exposed, knowing they're out there watching. I'm at a loss about what to do next.
I was working at a small hotel in a quiet town in the south as the night person. My job was from late at night until the morning. As a young woman of 22, doing this job, I've seen some odd things. The most frightening experience happened when I had just started. It was almost time for my shift, and I was using Tinder, hoping to meet someone interesting. I connected with a man who seemed nice. He liked dark, mysterious things, just like I did, so I was excited. We chatted for a bit, but then I had to leave for work, and we said our goodbyes. That evening was my first time working alone after my training. I was a bit anxious. Then, a man I felt like I'd seen before came to the front desk asking for me by my name. I felt uneasy because something about him was off. He told me he was the guy from Tinder and had guessed I might be working at the hotel he was staying at. That was a big warning sign for me. For the next two hours, I couldn't leave the desk because he kept talking to me. He shared too much about his past relationships and fights and even said inappropriate things to me. I had never faced something like this at work and I didn't know how to handle it. Eventually he went to his room and I stepped outside for a break. No sooner had I lit my cigarette than he appeared again. I learned he was a painter working in the area, not from around here. He talked about his hometown and kept getting too close to me. He wanted to smoke marijuana, and I just wanted him to leave me alone. So I pointed out a spot away from the cameras. Suddenly, he got too close, smelled my neck, and started touching me inappropriately. I quickly pushed him away and warned him never to touch me again. I dropped my cigarette grabbed my phone to call my manager and hurried back inside. But the man snatched my phone and sent himself a message, getting my number. The first thing he sent was a shocking picture of his body with extreme modifications. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Then he sent disturbing images and videos with threats of what he wanted to do to me, mentioning he knew where I was. I was terrified and couldn't understand why I didn't call the police. My manager wasn't picking up the phone either. So there I was hiding in the office, having the worst panic of my life. Then, he sent a video. I don't know why I looked at it, but it was horrible, violent and explicit in a way that made me sick. I locked myself in the back room, cried, and waited for hours until it was time to prepare breakfast for the hotel guests. The messages continued for days until I finally told my manager everything. He immediately removed the man from the hotel and banned him and his company from booking with us again. Looking back, I wish I had called the police, but I was too frightened at the moment. So to the terrifying man from Tinder, never try to reach me again. I need to share this story because it feels too strange to be true. I can hardly believe it happened. I'm not sure if this is the right place to post, but I hope it fits here. Sorry, this might get a bit lengthy. So, in the autumn, I decided to really try out dating apps. I wanted to meet new people. After finishing university in May, I moved back to my parents' place. It was around the start of COVID, so I felt quite isolated. I had only ever used Tinder, but a friend suggested I try Bumble. It started off as fun. I matched with a few guys. They were okay, but the conversations didn't last. I couldn't really connect with anyone there. One guy asked for my Snapchat, which I gave him, and we also followed each other on Instagram. To me, this was all innocent. I didn't think much of it. Our chats were brief and we stopped talking after a few days. He was a bit odd, which put me off. Months later, he messaged me on Instagram. He said he stopped following me because I supported Joe Biden in the election. Then he sent me more than 40 messages trying to get me to change my mind and support Trump. I'm very open-minded and I wouldn't have talked to him if I knew he was like this. He said others have blocked him for doing the same thing, asking me to see his point of view. His last messages were memes, trying to lighten the mood of the one-sided conversation. We hadn't talked enough for him to message me like that. I didn't reply. I didn't block him after that. I just let him see that I had read his messages. Then I stopped following him. The next day, I saw that he had taken back all his messages. Every single one was gone. I quickly recorded my screen and shared it with my friend because it felt really strange and scary. That seemed to be the end of it, and I didn't think much about him after that. But a few weeks ago, while looking through Facebook, I stumbled upon a news post from a station near the town where this guy lived, about an hour away from me. The news was about a man who had used a gun to kill an elderly woman, 87 years old, living in his building. 
he had tried to force other people out of their homes until another resident stopped him to protect everyone. Reading the details, the man's name and face looked so familiar. Then it hit me. It was him. I found the screen recording of his messages I had saved, confirming it was indeed him. I felt a rush of fear, my hands were sweaty, and my heart was pounding. It's terrifying to think I had talked to him and experienced something so odd with him. Weeks have passed since I found out, and it still bothers me. I've been following the news for more updates on the incident. I keep thinking about the what-ifs. What if I had confronted him, called him out, and it led to something worse? What if he had targeted me? I truly wish peace for the woman he took away so senselessly. Thank you for listening to my story. Be careful with dating apps. You never really know who you're talking to or what they might do. It all began in February last year when my friend Anna decided she wanted to find someone special. So she downloaded a dating app called Tinder to start her search. She found a profile of a guy around his mid-twenties, with light skin and curly hair. Anna liked his profile and swiped right to show her interest. Not long after, she got a message from the app saying she and the guy had matched. They began chatting and got along well. But after a while, Anna didn't think much of it. But then, things started to get weird. The guy began sending her too many messages, non-stop. Eventually, Anna got annoyed and blocked him. Fast forward to August, Anna and I, bored, decided to drive to the mall, which was quite far from where we lived. Our friend Lisa joined us, driving her car to make the journey more fun. After spending the day at the mall, we started our trip back home around 6.30 p.m. That's when things felt off. Suddenly, Anna received a friend request on Snapchat from the guy she had blocked months ago. Anna was really upset and told him to leave her alone, then blocked him again. We tried to forget about it and enjoy the rest of our day, hoping that would be the end of it. But it wasn't. We decided to stay over at Lisa's place to make sure Anna wasn't alone. During the night, I woke up needing the bathroom. That's when I saw a dark figure outside the bedroom window. I screamed, waking everyone up, including Lisa's dad. I explained what I saw, and Lisa's dad went outside to check. He found someone lurking there, wearing a mask. He tackled the intruder, and to our horror, it was the same guy Anna had blocked. We called the police, and they arrived quickly, arresting him. From the outside, this story might not seem too scary, but living through it was terrifying for us. It was a horror we never want to experience again. In late 2017, after feeling heartbroken for a long time, I decided it was time to start meeting new people again. So I made a decision that now seems quite silly. I joined Tinder. I had used Tinder before, but nothing prepared me for what was about to happen. Near the end of October, I matched with a guy named Tom. Tom seemed alright at first glance. He was charming and polite. We chatted for a couple of weeks and agreed to meet up for a date. We planned to meet in a city he had just moved to, which was not too far from where I lived, about 40 minutes away. I arrived at the bar we had agreed on first and waited for him. He was late by about 15 minutes, but when he showed up, he looked mostly like his photos, which was a relief. However, the moment he started speaking, something felt off. His voice sounded like he was about to cry at any moment. It was unsettling. He had several tattoos, one of which was the all-seeing eye, often linked with the Illuminati. Trying to lighten the mood, I made a joke about it, saying, Illuminati confirmed you must know all the secrets, right? His response was sharp and serious. What are you talking about? Don't talk about things like that here. I laughed it off, but he didn't seem to find it funny at all. He then made a strange comment about knowing people who had passed away. I didn't know what to say to that. About 20 minutes later, feeling uneasy, I had asked a few friends to come to the bar. When I moved to sit closer to him so my friends could fit into the booth, he immediately put his hand on my knee and squeezed it very hard. It wasn't a gentle touch, it was forceful. I told him firmly to stop, and he whispered in my ear, You have lovely kneecaps. That was so strange and creepy. After my friends left, I noticed he had drunk seven beers, and it was only a Tuesday night. As I was paying my bill, he stood uncomfortably close behind me, and I could tell he was very aroused. I quickly signed off my bill and moved away from him. Just as I was about to say goodbye, it started to rain heavily. He then told me he had walked to the bar 
and asked if I could give him a ride home. I didn't want to, but I felt bad about the rain, so I agreed. During the short drive to his place, he mentioned that he was actually staying in his sister's basement and not in his own house. When we arrived, he tried to kiss me. I turned my cheek to avoid him, but he grabbed my face and forced his tongue into my mouth. I pushed him away, but he tried again. I finally got him to stop and told him to leave my car. His response was shocking. He said he was in love with me and insisted I come inside to meet his sister and her husband. I was firm and told him I'd call the police if he didn't get out. He started crying but left my car eventually. And that was my terrifying experience with a guy from Tinder. What a scary encounter. I matched with a girl on Tinder named Lisa. Our first date was on February 3rd. Lisa knew from the start that I had just ended a long relationship with Anna and that we still talked sometimes. By the end of February, Lisa and I began to call each other boyfriend and girlfriend. Three days ago while I was taking a shower, Lisa snooped through my phone. She found some messages between Anna and me. Some were just friendly chats, and others were more loving, sent before Lisa and I even knew each other. When I finished showering, I saw Lisa packing her bags, ready to leave, holding my phone. She had sent messages to many of my contacts, saying things like, Turns out I'm a jerk and Anna is playing games. She also got into my Facebook account, posting mean things about Anna and removing many of my friends. She did the same on my Twitter. I had to borrow a phone from a workmate to try and get in touch with her and recover my social media accounts. Once she realized I was trying to fix things, she changed all my passwords, including my email. Later, she said she wanted to talk and suggested meeting at my place. I agreed, hoping to get my phone and access back. She returned my phone and forced me to call Anna in front of her, telling her I was cutting her off. I had already warned Anna that something like this might happen, and we should just pretend. Since we both had acting experience, we managed to fake a heated argument on the speakerphone for Lisa to hear. Lisa gives back my passwords, and I quickly change them. I tell her it's over between us, and she can't believe I'm breaking up with her for what happened. She tries to reach out through Facebook, but I block her. I block her everywhere, but she starts calling me repeatedly, staying silent if I answer. Eventually, I block her number too. Then, calls start coming from a different number, one from Colorado. Tired of it, I go to my phone company and get a new number. I even change my house locks, fearing she might have made a copy of the key. The day after, Lisa creates a Facebook page to insult me and Anna, and somehow gets into another Twitter account of mine. I warn her, saying if she contacts me or talks about anyone I know again, I'll go to the police. Suddenly, I receive an email about a credit card approval from a bank I never use. I call the bank, explain the situation, and they lock the account. After talking to my friends, I decide it's time to involve the police. When they arrive, they reveal that Lisa isn't even her real name. It's something entirely different. They issue her a warning for harassment. Now, if she tries anything else, she'll be arrested. On Monday, I'm on the phone with fraud departments, freezing and investigating my accounts. It's been a lot to handle, and this story is just the surface. I'm sharing this because, now that the police are involved, and I've had to take measures like changing locks and phone numbers, I'm beginning to feel the emotional toll of being mistreated and stalked by someone I was beginning to care for. I'm struggling with how to cope with this. I really wish none of this had ever happened. I'm 20 years old and not new to the weirdness the internet can throw at you. But what happened with this one guy, let's call him Max, truly gave me chills. We matched on a dating app a while back. Max seemed okay at first, and after chatting for a bit, I shared my Snapchat with him. Our conversation fizzled out soon, and I didn't think much of it. I was careful enough not to tell him my exact town, only mentioning a nearby city that's pretty big, thinking that would keep my location vague enough. But then, a few weeks ago, Max popped up again, sending messages and trying to restart our chat with casual talk. It felt normal until the eve of the new year rolled around. The day before New Year's Eve, Max texted saying he'd be near the city I mentioned and suggested we meet for lunch. I was non-committal, telling him maybe and that I'd get back to him. That New Year's Eve, I was busy preparing for a party with my friends, barely checking my phone. It was around 7.30 in the evening when I finally glanced at my Snapchat. 
I was startled to see messages and a missed call from Max, all saying he was in my city. Apologizing for the late reply, I messaged him back. He read my message almost instantly, and his reaction was far from calm. Max's sudden anger was unexpected and it set off alarm bells in my head. It's one thing to be disappointed, but his intense reaction over a missed meetup was a red flag. Little did I know, this was just the beginning of a series of creepy events that would make me question the safety of my online interactions and the information I share. As the night progressed, the situation took a darker turn, hinting at a horror I had never anticipated encountering in my everyday life. Max's next message was hard to believe. He said, Just so you know, I'm not happy with someone who ignores calls after I drove six whole hours to meet her. I stared at the message, wondering if he was joking. I typed back, confused, asking what he meant. I reminded him he didn't travel six hours just for me. Max insisted we had plans, questioning why else he would come. This confused me more because we never set any plans. He mentioned being in the area, but I assumed it was for work or visiting someone. It's common for people to come here for those reasons. I explained that to Max, stressing that we never agreed to meet and I never asked him to make such a long trip for me. He claimed he waited two hours with flowers he bought for me. This added to my confusion. We hadn't agreed on a time or place, nor had we confirmed any plans. Telling someone you'll be nearby doesn't mean you've made plans. I apologized but reiterated that we had no official plans. Then, Max demanded I make it up to him by visiting him the next day. That was the last straw. Remembering that my location was shared on Snapchat, I panicked, thinking he could find my house. I immediately turned off my location but didn't remove him from Snapchat, just in case he decided to show up. Thankfully, I haven't heard from him since. The thought of someone taking such a misunderstanding to an extreme level, possibly tracking me down, was frightening. It was a wake-up call about the dangers of sharing too much online, and a reminder that not everyone has the best intentions. The incident left a shadow of unease that lingered, making me wary of new connections and the digital footprints we leave.